Hey guys, I wanted to take a minute before the show to talk about this episode. I want you to know first off that this episode is deeply saddening and deeply personal to not only myself, but people that are involved in this interview tonight. I want you to understand that the lives of so many families were changed by the actions of one person. Because on July 7, 2016, a coward opened fire in Dallas, Texas during a Black Lives Matter rally. It left five officers dead and 11 more injured. Civilians attending the rally also received injuries up to and including being shot themselves. What ensued was a fierce battle that left scars way deeper than anything physical. That night, five families' lives were changed forever because of the actions of one man. In this time of national turmoil, with riots and political unrest, we hope to tell the story of what these men and women who decide to leave their families every day and protect the public go through on a personal basis. I would like you to take away three things from this interview. One, where you can help officers' families when they are killed in the line of duty. Two, where you can find this amazing book and how you can order a copy. And three, the most important thing of this entire interview. The names of the five officers that lost their lives that hot summer night in Dallas, Texas, just four short years ago. DPD Senior Corporal Lorne Ahrens, DPD Officer Michael Kroll, DPD Sergeant Michael Smith, DART Officer Brent Thompson, DPD Officer Patricio Patrick Zamaripa. Once again, I tell you, this story is deeply personal and sad. And we hope that we have done justice for the memory of those officers and all of the heroes that brought this horrific incident to a close. Please listen to this story. Never forget it. Now on to the show. In three, two, one, and we're live. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you were here? How about no, you crazy Dutch bastard? What we've got here is failure to communicate. 60% of the time, it works every time. That doesn't make sense. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. That's cute. I remember when I had my first beer. Why so serious? I am serious. And don't call me sir. What's up, everybody? It's Friday night. It's the DTD show, Dads That Drink. We're back up in your air holes. Tonight, we have a very, very special show. It's going to be a little somber in parts. It's going to be a little dark in parts. But we think this story really needs to get out there. There's an author out there, Jamie Thompson, who did an outstanding book on what happened in Dallas that changed the face of law enforcement and changed the face of the United States four years ago. So tonight, we're gonna talk about the book Standoff. And our guest tonight is SWAT team member, Matt Baines, who was in this from the beginning all the way to the end. So let's talk a little bit about the book first. On the evening of July 7, 2016, protesters gathered in cities across the nation after police shot two black men, Philando Castillo and Alton Sterling. As officers patrolled a march in Dallas, a young man stepped out of an SUV wearing a bulletproof vest and carrying a high-powered rifle. He killed five officers and wounded 11 others. It fell to a small group of cops to corner the shooter inside a community college where a fierce gun battle was followed by a stalemate. Crisis negotiator Larry Gordon, a 21-year department veteran, spent hours bonding with a gunman over childhood ghosts and the death and shared experiences of racial injustice in America. While his colleagues devised an unprecedented plan to bring the night to its dramatic end, Thompson's minute-by-minute -minute account includes intimate portrayals of the negotiator, a surgeon who operated on the fallen soldiers, officers, a mother of four shot down in the street, and the SWAT officers tasked with stopping the gunman. This is a deeply affecting story of real people navigating a terrifying crisis and a city's attempt to heal its divisions. Tonight, we welcome Matt Baines. Now, Matt was in the Coast Guard from 1995 to 1999. He served in the enlisted ranks as a boatsman, 
Uh, third class, he patrolled the Caribbean for narcotics as well as served as small boat crewman for counter narcotics patrols and search and rescue missions in both the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. He was stationed in New Orleans and South Padre Island, Texas. Some of his other duties included immigration as well as vessel checks for all applicable federal safety regulations and narcotics enforcements. He has a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. He joined the Dallas Police Department in 2001 after the 9-11 attacks. From 2002 to 2008, he worked street patrol. From 2008 to 2011, he worked in the undercover street squads. He applied for and was selected to the narcotics divisions. He spent a year in uniform enforcement and was selected as an undercover detective. He spent years working as a street level undercover dope dealer, 20 to hundred dollar dope deals from dangerous low level users and dealers. In 2011, he was moved to the clandestine lab squad. Now, when he moved to the clandestine lab squad, he was involved in mid-level investigations. He earned certifications in making hazardous entry into meth lab environments while wearing the required respirator equipment. Baines was involved in two shootings while in the lab squad, one during an undercover drug buy that turned into a robbery and one while executing a search warrant on a marijuana house. From 2013 to 2017, Baines moved to Dallas SWAT. While in SWAT, he was trained as an assaulter, less lethal munitions, and hostage negotiator, among other things. Some of the more publicized operations that he took part of were Dallas Police Headquarters' attack on June 13, 2015, where an armed gunman attacked the headquarters building with rigged explosives and an AK while inside an armored van. The BLM protests, which we're going to talk about tonight, ambush was on July 7, 2016, where 12 officers were shot and five officers were killed before SWAT officers were able to track the suspect down inside a college and engage in a fierce gun battle. After hours of failed negotiations, SWAT officers used a robot rigged with explosives to kill the suspects, which was an unprecedented move for police all over the United States and for that matter in the world. 2017, he moved back to narcotics, and now he is in the training unit. He's responsible for training all new undercovers, officer rescue, vehicle assaults, firearms, tactical, and applicable training for the Dallas Police Department. Please, everyone help me in welcoming Matt Baines. Welcome, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dustin. Thanks for being here, Matt. Yes, sir. Good to be it's, here, uh, It's really, really good to talk to you on here. Uh, I think this story needs to be told. I think with everything going on in the world right now that we need to hear exactly what we are going to hear tonight. We need to hear the other side of the coin. We need people to understand that the media and things have been blowing things up that we know and that we have, in speaking about you, taken part in. And we need them to know from the officer's point of view, from the spouse's point of view, from all those different things that no one thinks about when they see those news. So, Let's start off with your career. Of course, you did patrol. You did normal things, uh, chase down suspects, put people in jail. But your career really started to take off once you moved into narcotics. You were there as a uniform, and then you moved into the undercover positions. So let's start out with just your uh, undercover positions for a while. Let's talk about what you did, kind of the couple of years you did that, and we'll move on from there. Okay. Well, it's... Um the hierarchy uh, starts it as uniform and then the next move up uh, would be street squads. And it's, I would say like that your quality of life complaints, you know, when you got the, uh, the crack dealer living next door to you in the neighborhood and he's selling 20, $50, hundred dollar rocks, that's street level dope. Um, and there's hundreds of those, you know, in the city of Dallas. And so, Every detective has kind of got has got a you know overloaded isn't with their caseload. So <clears throat> basically, that was our responsibility. The street squads is probably the bread and butter of the narcotics division, and um, you know a lot of activity. Uh, execute hundreds of warrants each year. Um, make probably probably even make hundreds of buys every year. Um, I don't know if that's an exaggeration or not, but it's I mean. It wouldn't be it wouldn't surprise me if you made 150 undercover buys, you know, street level deals every in a year's time. <clears throat> um, and then we execute the warrants. Um, you know, we uh, take the entry team, uh, hit the house, um, put them in jail, and then on to the next case. 
So street squads is very fast paced. It's probably the most dangerous element there is. Um, once you move into mid level and higher level, it's more business oriented. Um, the, the bad guys don't want problems. They just want your money, um, larger sums of money. Um, and it's the, you know, the lower level ones that are more desperate, more dangerous. Uh, that's, that's kind of my opinion after doing it for, uh, you know, six, seven years in street squads. Um, so that kind of answer you. Yeah. So yeah. let's kind of go into your, your alter ego that you did. Uh, and I want to talk about that because I think it played a part in not only the shooting that you were involved in, but a lot into your character and how you were able as a very obviously white man able to move into areas of the city where you normally would stand out where you could work. So let's talk about your, your undercover persona first. So I, I want you to kind of set that up because it's a pretty great story. Sure. Well, you have to be very natural and, and the only way to be very natural is kind of be yourself, you know? Um, and that's probably the hardest thing after you've been in, after you get out of the academy and then you go to patrol for all those years and you're so starched and so rigid and, and every move you make in uniform is subconscious and you look like a cop, you talk like one, you smell like one, you're a cop, you know? And that is the hardest thing for new detectives is to shake that, shake that off and get used to letting people within your reactionary gap, letting people get close to you, not blading your stance, not sending off all those cues. And for me, the easiest way to do that is to just kind of be who you are. And um, as opposed to, you're not going to see me trying to grow some dreads and going and, and getting a gold grill and, walking with a limp, you know, uh, you'll see me with a long goatee. I wore a, a bandana, cowboy boots, uh, dirty blue jeans, and just acted natural. Um, but you know, as an undercover, you, you have to learn to do and say and, and act in ways that you would never act even, you know, especially as a, as a uniformed officer, but, but more so just as a person out in public. Um, and for me, it was, you know, the more kind of outlandish I acted, the more I could kind of throw them off, so to speak, um, make them be less suspicious. And so, you know, I could be pretty obnoxious. Um, and if they might be thinking, hey, man, I don't know this, this dude, he might be a cop. And then I do or say something that throws them off, you know, because I could, you know, you get to where you can read people pretty good. And if I needed to you know, I guess use a distraction, so to speak, you know, I didn't have a problem doing that. And, uh, yeah, I just didn't really have any, a lot of issues doing undercover work at all. I actually enjoyed it, you know, and made a lot of UC buys when I did it. So I was going to ask you is, <clears throat> you know, people that don't know my wife's a cop and she was in or is in narcotics and she did some undercover stuff. So I'm familiar with, with how that works, but, um, I was going to ask you what your look was, um, you know, the beards and, <laughs> and things. Uh, so you pretty much, um, were yourself, you just grew your beard out longer and dress a little dirtier, huh? Yeah. Now when we, when we say longer, I mean, uh, it would, it was almost down to my waist. Um, and you know, I would braid it, uh, put some chrome sunglasses on a do rag, mm -hmm. some sleeveless dirty t-shirts and I rode a motorcycle also um and i mean it just wasn't hard to blend and you know i could go to you know your your black neighborhoods just like that and not have a problem um because it was pretty obvious that i was down there for for one thing um the hispanics never had a problem um sometimes the white guys were actually my most challenging but uh you know it's just weird how it works out so why do you think that is that that the whites uh white guys that you were dealing with why do you think that that was your most challenging do you think it took you out of character in your mind do you think it put you on a different level when you were working uh do you do you I, think I that they could just that, pick up on natural vibes what what was it i felt that they dealt more closely with people they knew um and i'm not going to say that that 
any one culture or community had had more of an addiction than the other because I, I wouldn't I wouldn't believe that. But um, they just seemed the white dope dealers seemed more paranoid to me. They would check me harder. Um, my look was was pretty obvious. You know, I was you know I kind of stood out even even out in public with my family and kids. You know, when I walk in, you know, everybody would turn and look and double take like. <laughs> What's this dude doing with that uh, nice looking family? And so it was obvious that they'd never seen me. And that's the best way I, I could describe it. I threw a little more of a red flag, in my opinion, you know, dealing with some of the white dope dealers. And so do you want to talk a little bit about when you, you move past Street Squad, you go into clan, clandestine lab operations, you start working, uh, I would say, a, a, a bigger level uh, more danger, not, not necessarily more dangerous operations, but where you're having to wear gear to go in, there's chemicals involved, high risk of explosion. When you move over there, is there more pressure on you? Is there less pressure on you? Or do you feel like, okay, I've done what I need to do. I know how to handle this. Now I just need to take this next step. So environmentally, it was more dangerous. Um, due to, you know, your meth cooks and, and all that stuff and the, and all the extra gear and the hazmat stuff. Um, it was less pressure um, because you were allotted as much time as you needed to do an investigation. Um, and a lot of times you were using federal money. You know, the funds were, were you know, there were more funds for you to spend. Um, you could get your case to go federal and then you could support from different uh, federal agencies. And so I would say it was quite a bit less pressure going to mid-level because you just uh, you didn't have to be turning over um, you know one case after the next every week you're on a new dope house or two dope houses a week um, so yeah it was, it was definitely a promotion and so when you when you got over there this is where you moved into we say it's not more dangerous but this is where you actually got into your shootings um, and what I want to talk about first is people here on the news, they see on TV, they see cops getting in shootings and they don't understand the mentality or the mind state that goes behind it, that there's a lot more involved in just pulling out a gun and shooting. So first let's talk about the mind state that goes into it. Of course, no one goes to work thinking, I, I want to do this today. No one wants to do that. And you have been in all the things that you've been in, you know that better than most know right. that. Yeah. Uh, so when you get into those shootings, before we get into the story of the actual shooting when you were working undercover, let's talk about the mind state, what you go through psychologically, physically, everything when you get into that shoot, no shoot scenario. Um, basically, you're saying all the physiological things that happen to you when you're in a shooting. Is that what you're asking? Yes, sir. Okay. It. I've found because I found that very interesting, actually, because of what has happened to me. Um, and I, I actually talked to officers that I know that have been in shootings and it's kind of different for everybody. But one thing's for sure is everybody experiences uh, a, a massive pucker factor in one way or another. Mine is auditory exclusion. It's happened every time. So the, the way I can describe it is a lot of your senses, several of them are going to just shut down completely. And then the other ones are going to be like superhero level and mine is vision. Um, the, the, the first shooting I got into, I mean, I literally could, could see my first round leave the, the muzzle. I mean, it, it was it's hard to explain in my front sight, you know, my front sight on my pistol was the size of a basketball. Um, but I couldn't hear anything and everything slowed down, you know, and it was complete 100 focus in, in my vision. And um, the July 7th shooting was kind of the same way. Um, but then I went completely deaf to my environment. Um, you know, well, I guess we'll get more into that on the July 7th shooting as well in, in detail in a little while. But uh, for me, that's what it is. My vision becomes really, really like unexplainably sharp and keen, but I lose hearing completely. And, then, and you and found that in, in all of them that you've been in, you found that yeah. that happens. And the second one, the second shooting was when we were serving a warrant. And um, I remember it happening to me again. And I actually consciously made myself 
hey, you know, wake up and so you can hear what's going on. And, you know, I, I, I kind of made a little mental note to myself, pay attention with the, you know, I'm looking at my target, but I, I noticed that I wasn't hearing. And as soon as I made a mental note of that, you know, I got all my faculties back pretty quick. So everybody's different though. I've talked to other people who have, uh, let me turn my volume up. I've talked okay. to other people and they say like, you know, they lose other senses. So in my opinion, vision is a good one to have though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I so, so getting to the odd story, is that, did, I mean, is there a point in time during the incidents that it kicks in? Is it when your gun's drawn? Is it when you know there's already shots on you? Is it, is it before you think it's going to happen or what's the, I'm just, that's really uh, interesting to me how that works. Right. Well, um, when it's when, when it's go time, that's when it happens. Okay. But see the, the first shooting is really a whole different set of dynamics. You know, it, it was, I had, uh, been basically a hostage for half an hour mm. and mm. The, the, this shooting built up and built up and built up until it finally popped off. Um, you know, uh, there's you, most of your officer, police officer involved shootings are, you know, you walk up to the car and you ask to see the proof of insurance and driver's license and bam, 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 you're in the shooting and it happened super quick. It's over. Um, that's not the way this was. This one was um, <laughs> long and drawn out. The gun battle wasn't, but getting to that gunfight it took it took a while and so i'm sure that probably paid, played a part in it um but yeah it's it's i don't know it's different every situation so let's let's uh, set that uh, night yeah. up Let, let's go into that that very first night okay um let's let's talk about first you going out there okay uh, what what was your plan? What was going on behind this? And then what actually happened? And the reason we want to point this out is we want to show that, you know, things can go from sugar to shit real quick uh, without you knowing. And so I want you to set it up just to show how smooth it can go and then how it can turn left on you real quick. Okay. Um, this was not my first time to, to make a dope, uh, to buy dope from this suspect. Um, I had already dealt with him prior. I went in, uh, because we needed to re up our probable cause, um, long story, but I had to go back a second time and I'd been dealing with this, uh, older guy and I'm going to cut this, you know, super short here, but it ended up being the doorman, okay. um, and not the dealer. Of course, I didn't know that because the first time I went in there, doorman was there. We, uh, talked for a little while and he served me and this is a street level buy i was in mid-level but i was doing street level uh buy on this particular case um and again a long story so the second time i went back he was there the doorman was there and while i'm doing business with him the actual uh, trap house um dope dealer shows up i'd never seen him before didn't know who he was um and he kind of interrupted my little dope deal and found out that his doorman was conducting business oh. while he was gone and, and shit went south super quick. Oh man. Um, and yeah, and it turned into a, a robbery and you know, the door was barricaded. Um, my open line is kind of like my internet. Apparently it went down <laughs> and I, uh, I was unaware of that because I, you know, it's not like I can say, Hey, can you hang on a minute? Let me check. Uh, let me check and see if my, my wire is hot so my rescue team can come in here and save me. Yeah. <laughs> so so I'm playing it off, giving rescue signals, um, knowing that it's it's very obvious that this has gone bad and rescue is not happening. And so, you know, we're working through this and we're just kind of working through this robbery. And uh, it's just it's incredibly, <laughs> incredibly long story. But um, I ended up getting out of there and on the way out while he turned to unbarricade the door, I unrobbed myself. I took, I took my money back off the table before I left. Cause he wasn't, he didn't see that. I probably shouldn't have done that. But anyway, um, <laughs> he, he, he comes, Let's piss uh, the guy off as you're leaving. 
and I would have got away with it, you know, if I could have got out of there quick enough. <laughs> but so he, he tracked me down in the parking lot and then um, we kind of had a little standoff and, a, and there was two of them and, uh, you know, the shooting happened and, you know, luckily I got out of there. And so that, that's kind of a synopsis of the first one. And so the the second one that you get involved in, it's actually while you're serving a search warrant. So if you can kind of set this one up, because this one's going to be different. This is like we talked about in the beginning where you said in the first one, you're set aside, you, you know, the tension's building, there, there's time to think about everything, time to think about what you would do. The second one, it goes south on you quick uh, and you've got to go right to it. So let's set that one up and then move through that shooting too. Sure. Now, what I guess a lot of people don't understand, and these these narcotic search warrants are approved by countless a number of people to include a judge before we are given the permission and authority to just go uh, make entry into somebody's house, and that's that's being completely misunderstood here lately um, because of what's going on. Um, you know, you can't just say, you know, somebody come up to you, Hey, my neighbor's selling dope. And you go, okay, I'm gonna go round up, you know, 20 of my uh, police officer buddies. And we're going to go crash down the front door and the back door. It just doesn't, it just doesn't work that way. So, uh, after an investigation and the probable cause was developed and a judge signed the warrant, we executed the warrant and I was on the front door. There was a window team off to my right, um, that took a window and as they were, taking the window and we were getting ready and we were making entry on the front door. They exchanged gunfire and one of the officers was hit probably six feet to my right on the window team. Um, and at that point, the suspect moved across the house and we started extracting off the front porch and we just kind of paralleled each other across a window. And um, that's where my second shooting happened. It was, it was very fast. So, Anyway, and so did you find that, that the same things happened to you? Uh, auditory exclusion, you said that yep. you did and you kind of checked yourself. So are, are we talking milliseconds of you, you check yourself sure. and go, boom, I got to move into this. Uh, and, 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 that, and that's what's impressive is how fast the human mind can work. And I literally think it can work as fast as, uh, as bullets fly because the amount of stuff that you can see and comprehend and calculate by the time you've gotten your second round off is, is it's hard to explain. You, there's no way to really explain it. Um, and so, well, I kind of lost train of thought, but um, so, so what I would say is, so that's yeah. probably testament to your training, to muscle memory, to, 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 you know, training in those environments, especially urban environments, <laughs> excuse me. And uh, target identification, which target identification is a chap 15th chapter in, in, in the book. And I know it's probably different. It might to do more with SWAT and some of those snipers things. But um, can you tell me how like your preparation and how much um, training goes in uh, to what you're doing before you ever go into a place? Target identification is, is started at the police academy. Um, in RBT reality based um, training. And it, it never goes away throughout your police career. Now, when you join a, a specialized team such as uh, SWAT, narcotics, gang unit, any, any, any squad or team that's gonna be operational, uh, meaning serving dynamic warrants, um, felony, fugitive arrest warrants, thing like that, you're gonna, you're gonna go through force on force training and you're gonna be confronted instantly with um, shoot and no shoot targets. And there are gonna be circumstances involved in that training, such as low light, um, a dark object in the hand, um, a suspect in a fighting stance that may be armed or not armed. And that's the type of, you know, target identification that, um, that, that police officers have been training for probably long before, I've been on 19 years and it was, you know, being trained before I came on. Um, but in some of the, more operational units it's it's heavily trained on i mean every every warrant update or every entry school you go to hostage rescue any any of your training is always going to have on your scenarios compliant or 
innocent or no shoot targets, whether they're paper targets, whether they're live actors, um, they're always going to be your lethal threats mixed in with your uh, no shoot targets. So can you, can you expand on the, the live actors part? Cause a lot of times we may not understand that. I, I know what it is, but can you explain what that is? That's using uh, role players, uh, usually other officers. Um, aside from liability reasons, it's, it's, it's normally not good to get um, people who aren't experienced police officers in your role play because they do the whole, you know, get shot and then all of a sudden come back to life type. <laughs> crap. And it, it ends up people getting injured and getting their ass beat, you know, type thing. But um, so role live actors, um, when you have a training objective, it is very important for your actors to understand what the training objective is. If we're trying to set up, you know, an ambush in a hard corner, you can, as an instructor, you can slowly move and pick the angles and you want that actor standing in that spot right there, that specific spot. And if you have an actor that likes to freelance or kind of make up his own uh, idea of the scenario, it's going to always conflict with what the training objective that the trainer is setting up. So live actors is, is our most beneficial way of, of creating scenarios. Um, one dimensional or, or, or paper targets are one dimensional. Um, you can't give them verbal commands. Um, you know, there, there's severe limitations to using paper targets or, or mannequins or dummies, you know, but due to budget restraints, personnel issues and all this other stuff, Half the time we train, it's going to be on a on a static target, you know, a paper target or one dimensional target or something. And that's a good um, point to bring up is, you know, yeah. you know, defund the police or, oh, defund and then train. Right. You know, it's actually the opposite. And, and what you're saying is a testament to just how much that's gibberish um, and the importance. I mean, look, you guys are being trained to go in these environments where, where you're target after bad guys and you're still trying to sort through who not to shoot because you don't need to shoot them and, and who to take out um, based on a hundreds of hours of training. So I think it's, it's actually um, an interesting dynamic how that's flipped in the media and it's flipped on its head in some of the other, uh, you know, social, social justice warriors and uh, whether it's a search warrant or the training, because I think, you know, like you said, a live actor training, in, in having those resources, especially with narcotics or you're, you're going and doing mid-level stuff. That's, that's uber important in my opinion. And, and I'm not a police. I'm, I'm coming from someone that doesn't know, you know, I'm, sure. I'm kind of the common citizen. Is that fair to say? It's a, it's a hundred percent correct. And with, with these, um, these critics that, you know, if you, if you sell insurance for a living, I, I don't see, me or any other police officers, you know, getting in your business, telling you how to sell insurance and, 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 and these, and I'm just using that as some random profession. I mean, our, our heaviest critics are people that have never put on a Sam Brown, you know, never slung a gun belt, never, never worn a badge. Um, and nine times out of 10, they're going to be at the comfort of their air conditioned office behind the computer. Um, and just being shocked at this for, four second video they saw of a cop using force against somebody. Um, just the complete naive, ignorant, um, <laughs> but they're going to be the first to spout off and say what should have been done. Um, you know, my, my advice to them is sign up, you know, come, come get some, see, see what it's like out here. Um, you know, come, come get the badge and, and get you some, and then, then we'll see, you know, we'll see what you think after a year. And, and, and it's just making it dangerous for these officers. We watch all these videos of these officers failing to react due to uh, not having support of first the, uh, the media, then the community, but even worse, their own chain of command. So it's just the profession is getting more and more dangerous. And so uh, someone has already put in that you're their hero, um, uh, Clark Goldsby. I think that's how you say his name that 
that uh, when he grows up, he wants to be just like you. But we well, do I'll have an actual nightmare. question uh, that, that came in, and it says, uh, can you all discuss how much probable cause is generally needed for a judge to sign a search warrant on a drug suspect? And I think the reason this question is being asked is because everything's going on in Louisville sure. right now. Right. Uh, with That's Brian a good question. Taylor. That, that's an outstanding question. The best way I'm going to describe it, but it's not always true, tangible evidence. If I go in a dope house and I make a buy of, of a white rock-like substance and it tests positive for cocaine, there's your probable cause. Um, if I go in there and they got a dope scale out, they got money, they got a stack of cash, they've got individually packaged little baggies of white rock-like substance believed to be cocaine and everything that I'm seeing as an experienced and trained officer is indicative of illegal street level narcotic sales. That is also a probable cause. So I hope that answers the question. Um, and, and again, that's, what's gotten me just <laughs> exhausted in all these, these protests and these riots. Um, I mean, it's, these are probable cause warrants. It's that simple. None of this stuff. Is and these are signed by a judge. Sure. Yeah. Signed by a judge. And, and you present the information. And, and many times, maybe maybe not street level, but mid-level or higher, there's months of surveillance that, that goes sure. on, I would assume. And, and there's um, many different of uh, the tools that um, police officers can use and narcotics detectives can use to record or to, to um, whether it's um, – visual recording or it's it's a voice recording or it's um going and buying dope there 10 times and trying to get to the bigger guy i mean it didn't yeah. just oh we think something's fishy going on let's connect the dots and go do it and you know you gotta you gotta also look at some of the dynamics like um a no-knock warrant or a uh i mean the, the last thing or an arrest without a warrant. The last thing anybody wants to do, cop, anybody is, is to arrest someone without a warrant um, on a felony charge. These warrants are signed. I mean, there's after an investigation is done, either by an investigator, a detective, or um, you know, say an undercover deal, um, complete with surveillance, um, suspects positively identified prior to. I mean, it, there's just so much the, of the narrative that's never going to make it out there because it doesn't fit the narrative. Um, and these cops are just taking it on the chin over and over and over. And, and the more this insanity kicks off, the more paperwork is required, the more checks and balances that are, that are frivolous, that are not, that are not even that make it to the point where a $50 rock costs you a, two weeks worth of work of, doing and putting the same information over and over and over in all these different databases and who in the hell wants to do this job you know right so and then it's dangerous not to mention the fact that you can get your ass killed super quick and heaven help you if you have to you know really use a, a you know a high level of force on somebody then what and, and so let, let let's talk about that for a minute matt <clears throat> yeah when you talk about that it's reached kind of a level of insanity and there's just form after form. And so you see officers back away, not necessarily back away, but uh, it, it's, it turns into calculated risk. Is that a good word to use? That, that I would say an officer's entire life is based on calculated, calculated risks. risks. And you are, and you are charged with making the correct decision in a split second based on that calculated risk, whether it be how you approach a vehicle or if you're going to shoot somebody who's not showing you their hands or not. And it's so calculated we, risk. And, and so when we talk about that and, and we make that calculated risk less and less of a uh, calculated risk and more of a risk, we take that calculated out because sure. everything that happens becomes a risk instead of a calculated risk. So, uh, what we see is we see crime rise. We see um, an inability to uh, explain our roles unless we do it three different times. We have 47 hours worth of video, uh, all those different things. And so I guess the question would be, how do we start to fix that? How do we take that 
and turn it back the other way? Well, so defund the police, you know, more training for the police. Um, it's, it's the American society that, that needs training, not the police. Um, people need to learn how to act. Um, okay. It, it's, it's not hard to not get shot by a cop. I mean, it's, it's probably one of the easiest things you can not F up in your life is, is making it from your house to work without getting shot by a cop. Okay. I mean, and it's, I mean, it's, it's that easy. Um, and, and if, if people would take the time to comply because some lady just got a gun put in her face and got her purse or her car taken at gunpoint, you might fit that description of, as an active search for a suspect. That's about when you probably need to comply with an officer, you know, and then give him the chance to explain his actions. Um, now, I'm not going to put it all out on the American public. Cops need to quit being assholes too. Okay. Um, and you know, I've had my own personal ex bad experiences with police officers. Um, one, you know, a couple of them while I was just in the military, just getting talked to way wrong. And I learned in my twenties that if I was going to pursue a career in law enforcement, that's not going to, I'm, that's not the way I'm going to be. Um, and you know some of the some of the enforcement we take to generate revenue that's a whole nother story that i probably shouldn't even talk about but um <laughs> some of these, you know writing all these tickets um that's never a positive experience for police and the public um that's that's going to be a bad bad experience all day long but uh they're gonna get that money <laughs> so. well that's refreshing man. honestly it's refreshing to hear someone that has been in law enforcement at a high level and excelled to to call out hey police don't be assholes do your job right you know do all those things but but for me i could relate because um just some personal history for me but i was in uh college and uh uh playing playing ball at baylor and and i had an incident where two cops just came and grabbed me up and had no clue what was for um i later found out uh, a girlfriend's sorority sister said I was do you know being rude or did something and had two beers. It's public intoxication. I was handcuffed outside. They left me out there like that for like forty minutes. Just I was humiliated. Everyone knew who I was. Um, and you know I've had some other incidents, but you know, and even when I married my wife and we got to talk in, I didn't. I'm like, oh come on, you cops. Come, you know I know the games here, but as I you know, we dated and got to know and realized uh, I act also acted like a dumbass in a lot of those situations, and I deserved to um, to uh, pay the price if I broke the law. I mean, people get really bitter and angry even when they're wrong, and they were just caught. And and they oh, yeah. there's yeah. this whole d divisive um, disdain for the police, or oh, they're not the they're the bad guys. So I guess the whole point of this is it's easy to be misunderstood, uh, especially with, with police, but I think you're right. I think the citizens and um, people that may have bad experiences, that's not always the situation. And I've also been handled with very respectively, got out, got out without a ticket because it was yes, sir, no, ma'am, here's what you need. And I got to explain my situation um, in I thought that was badass cool. So I guess yeah. your point is, um, you're right. I think part of our issue is uh, uh, just comply. For me, it's like this. Um, why would you allow a police officer to be your judge and jury, live or die situation? Comply, do whatever, and go fight your battle where you need to go fight your battle if, if you get arrested. That's a judge, that's a jury of your peers don't allow a police officer to have to take your life. And I, I, right. That's the way I see it. And so going back into this, uh, we have some people asking some questions about you. We have talked about probable cause, but you mentioned in there that you had to go back to the, in your first shooting that house a second time to buy uh, more dope. So what they're asking is you mentioned buying a second time to get more probable cause. 
Is that normal? And I think the reason they're asking this is because once again, we want to reinforce that thousands and thousands of hours on the trigger at the range, thousands and thousands of hours in the classroom learning law and changing with the law, thousands and thousands of hours of doing what you do in order to get those search warrants signed the right way. Sure. And, you know, every case is going to be different. If you, um, for whatever reason, your motives are, if you want to identify somebody prior to the execution of the warrant, it might take you going in there as many times as you need to, to, uh, you know, I'm not going to re reveal any trade secrets, but there's ways you can get to get to know somebody. Um, and you also have a certain amount of time to execute a warrant and before it, it, it's no, it's no longer valid. And if that time lapses, then you no longer have probable cause. So there's, there's a, there's, a hundred different reasons why you would uh, go re up your PC. And so now let's kind of move forward into you going out of narcotics, you going to SWAT. Was that always a dream to move into that position? Was it a wild hair up your ass? Was it sure. something? What, what made you go from where you were, where you said you were very comfortable, very adept in the job to go over there? The, uh, now, of course, when I joined the PD, oh, I was I was going to be, yeah, I want to go to SWAT, SWAT, SWAT. And then, you know, after years of being out there, I, I completely lost interest in going to SWAT. And then um, the, the administrative side of undercover became so unbelievably exhausting that um, I was kind of at the point where I was exploring different ideas, um, but I was still very comfortable in my position. And they kind of reached out to me and I saw it as an opportunity. I was old, older for that job. I was 39 or something. I was late thirties and it kind of rekindled some of that old dream. And it was kind of one of those things where, man, you've got an opportunity here. Um, you have to either it's, it's now or never. And so I took the chance and it was the best job that I've ever had ever uh, by far. And I don't regret it at all. And so let's get, in, let's get into the book a little bit. So as you're introduced in the book, you and I have talked about this on numerous <laughs> occasion, how you're described in the book. Now, if people can't tell from the camera angle, uh, Matt is not the tallest guy in the world. He's not the shortest guy in the world. But let's talk about how you're introduced in the book. Because personally, I thought uh, this guy, I don't know. How, how can we describe him like that? He drinks out of a flask. Uh, he was asked to go to SWAT. I mean, this guy's, you know, let's, let's build him up a little more. So let's talk about, one, how you got involved with this book. Uh, and then two, um, how you're kind of introduced. And the reason I want to talk about that is because of your relationship with the author and the back and forth between you and her about how she describes each person, how she writes each person into this book. Sure. Well, uh, I became involved in the book because I was very much involved in the act, in the incident. Um, and she reached out to, as you see by the book, um, I don't know, 50 plus people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that was, that was my involvement. Um, and, and Jamie, uh, you know, if anybody ever gets the chance to sit down with her, that's a very deep people sh uh, person. She will draw things out of you that, um, you never planned on, <laughs> you know, sharing with, with someone. And the way she describes me in the book, that's that's her own. Uh, she described everybody the way she wanted to describe them. And so, yeah, I I was like, you know, damn, thanks. I, you know, you couldn't have, you should have just you could have just not said anything. <laughs> you know? Well, uh, let's go ahead. And, what, what was I mean? What was your character's name? Let's go ahead and tell everybody. My, well, what, what do you mean? Why boy Wayne? Oh, that. Oh, that character. I thought you meant the real life me. No, <laughs> but you know, my dad's name is Wayne. So I found that really good. Um, well, so you're, you're supposed to come up with your own, um, identity. Uh, you pretty much have to, it's a, you know, nobody else can come up with it for you. 
And so that's what they called me on the street was white boy Wayne at the dope houses where they knew me. Um, I'd be six deep in line at a dope house and the doorman would open the door and I would wave from the back of the line. They'd say, Hey, white boy Wayne's ass. They'd say, they'd bring his ass in here. <laughs> and I'd move up to the front of the line and, and get in there and, and buy my dope. So white boy Wayne was just a, uh, who I was out on the street. Um, and you know, being, you know, we've already talked about, you know, my MO was to be a little unsuspecting, you know, very inappropriate acting, uh, vulgar person. Just yeah. Awful. Crap, right. Yeah. And you know, I would, I would, uh, use prostitutes as, as my in probably more than anything else. Now, um, let, let's clarify that you didn't actually use <laughs> prostitutes as your end. <laughs> I, I, I want to I put a couple disclaimers out there. Yeah, One, uh, Matt did not use prostitutes to do his job. Real prostitutes. Uh, what he did was use that as a cover. Uh, it was a cover story, sure. the prostitutes. He didn't actually use prostitutes because they the were reason i say that is because i know a lot of people are watching that know you but there might be someone that watches this that doesn't know you and i really don't want uh anyone in your family to have to listen to that so uh i think what i meant though more is how she described you not as white boy wayne because i think that's kind of an overall feel in the book is the white boy wayne but i i I thought it was funny when she described your stature and just, uh, I mean, as it opens up on you, just not a very impressive guy. Right. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and so, and so that gives you your idea of, uh, you know, um, you couldn't, you had to say that you, you couldn't just say nothing at all. Like, Hey, that's what, yeah, that's, yeah, that's he, 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 he's bald uh anything uh he's dumb he's anything but uh, he's not really that impressive uh <laughs> right uh yeah, clearly clearly she hasn't seen uh pictures of you and stuff because you are more than uh well, you're wearing that shirt, more than up to muscle, this task is that what i should your, say uh, well, well, i mean do i need to do i need to take it off what, no, no don't I mean, do that again you did that I during the sound it, check and i really don't need you to do it again no, so I, I, I can see the type here as the book opens up on your character uh your very first scene is at the range and and i i'm gonna speak in strange terms about it but scene as she's describing you you're going to the range um she's saying how you fit in with swat um and that there you're you're a different kind of swat team member and by being a different kind of SWAT team member, there's a couple different things. One, nothing really phases you. So there's that white boy Wayne that shows up again. Nothing really phases you. Everything kind of slides off your back. Um, you're not really, um, you're not really, uh, I don't want to use the word bullied, but you're not really, you don't stand down to anyone, but you don't go after anyone aggressively. Um, and, and it makes you, seem as a different character. And, and as you read the book, you'll understand what I mean, that, that everyone is described in, in fantastic detail in this book. And, and you see that there are, you know, a hundred different personalities for a hundred different people. And when she described you, she says, uh, all these different things. How did that make you a good SWAT member? How did that make you someone that people could rely on to know you would be there when the time was, it was time to go? Because I am not worried. And it, first of all, when I showed up, I was a, kind of salty. You know, I, I had skins on the wall. I'm, I'm not trying to prove myself to not one person here, not one of them, not one of those SWAT team guys. Am I trying to flex on or prove anything to? I don't have time for that. I, I, just, I mean, that's just the best way to describe it. Um, you don't like me. That's cool. <laughs> you know, you do like me. That's cool too. Um, and I was worried about other things, you know, learning the new tactics, um, you know, and that for me was a struggle because for so many years I'd been doing the two net two man dynamic entry style and we switched over to immediate threat just on a, on a Friday, I'm doing two man dynamic on a Monday, I'm doing immediate mm -hmm. threat. And that was a, was a complete mind blow for me. 
So if we can take a second and just for people that don't understand what you're saying uh, and not really getting into tricks of the trade, but can we talk about the difference between that dynamic entry, that immediate threat, just so people understand why it's such a switch for you to go from Friday doing this to Monday doing this? Um, It is a completely different style of of running warrants on two-man dynamic. You and a partner are together from the front door to the back door from, from through the entire operation you have a partner um, and it's super easy. Not a lot of thinking involved. Um, and the immediate threat is, is this different threat priorities. Um, and you play off whoever's in front of you. And if you're number one, you make a decision, you go there and number two makes, he splits off of you and then you tap up, you link up and it's um, much safer, uh, a little slower, a team that's really polished like Dallas SWAT can probably do immediate threat just as quick as, as a team can do two man dynamic. Um, those guys are absolutely the best I've ever run with. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's a really a different, different set of tactics. Um, and it's a lot to learn. Uh, but once you, once you get the concept um, and you, you can still make mistakes and you still will make mistakes with immediate threat, two man dynamic, it's, kind of hard to screw up you know you follow the guy that's in front of you and you check blind spots that he's not checking and in the story um so that was that was my main stressor um that and trying to keep up with those younger guys you know physically uh i was in phenomenal shape um and and also not being the you know the best shooter uh I'm not going to say I was the best shooter in narcotics, but sometimes I was half the time I was probably. And um, when I go over to uh, SWAT, I just want to point out, these all seem like humble brags. I just, (laughs) (laughs) I was in phenomenal shape and, you know, but, but, but but I wasn't, but I'm a shape uh, round. That's a shape. So, (laughs) so, so can I ask you about your, your, yeah, when, when you're trying out for SWAT and you're in that opening week and you're going through all the training, can you tell everybody kind of what happened with how you found out you're going to be in SWAT and um, what you lost during that process? Yeah, we were, um, it was the last day of SWAT school and we were doing hostage rescue training and they had dismissed everybody after a thorough beat down and they let us out early. It was probably 4 p.m., and it was just hot as hell. And I was walking back to my Tahoe and Pup, you know, our ASL says, hey, Skeeter, come back here. And I'm thinking, damn, because we had just gotten smoked for something I did stupid during the training. And the whole squad was getting PT and push ups and sprints and stuff like that, probably because some stupid stuff I had, some mistake I had made. And um, I had that goatee and I had it in a, in a braid. So it wouldn't get hung in the rope and whatever else, you know, all the stuff we were doing. And so they kind of circled me and I'm like, oh, hell, what? <laughs> <laughs> and one of With my, yeah, and one of my teammates approaches me, Juante. He looks like a, just a battle axe, Choctaw warrior, something. He looks, you know, just like this badass. Anyway, he pulls a boot knife out and grabs my beard and just, right under my chin and he just takes it off and he says if you're if you're coming to SWAT you can't have that shit on your face and then I drove home in a Tahoe that day and it felt like I had stole it I hadn't been in a squad car and, <laughs> and hell I don't know it's eight nine years and uh I didn't even know how to turn the damn siren on in it you know <laughs> I actually I got flagged down. I, I actually, a- actually got flagged down on the way home really in the, in the, Uh, and I didn't even know what the some somebody did something crazy in traffic I'm not even watching where I'm going because I'm trying to figure out how to turn the computer on where the lights where all this I'm looking at all the all these buttons you know once again I'll point out Matt was looking where he was going uh he was just paying attention to other things in the car (laughs) right (laughs) so I hear somebody honking a horn. I look over and this dude's frantic and he's waving up. So I'm like, oh, hell no. So I roll the window and I was like, what's up? And he goes, aren't you? And he's pointing. He's like, aren't you going to do anything? Aren't you going to, you saw that. How can you not do anything about that? And I just said, 
not in my jurisdiction, buddy. Sorry. <laughs> so we have someone writing in that says the more you drink, the beadier your eyes get. <laughs> so yeah, I know all these. I know all these clowns on here. So, so let's one. let's get into what we came here for. Let's get into the book of standoff. Uh, we've talked about your past. Everyone can can appreciate where you came from. So the reason we wanted to set that up that way is because we wanted them to understand where you're going forward on this. Okay, where your mind is, what you've been through before, because you're not a normal police officer. You've been through numerous things, whether that be detective work, undercover work, warrant entry shootings. I mean, you've run the gamut while you were doing it. So to this, it would seem to the normal person looking in from the outside, this guy's got this, you know what I mean? Like this should be no trouble to him, but it, it was way different. And we talked about it. We had five officers dead. We had a total of 12 shot. Uh, the tone comes out. Uh, you hear it, you're about three miles away. Um, and let's take it from there going into the building. Okay. Um, yeah, I was, I was three miles off the X and getting, doing 90 plus you get there. I'd say a minute, I was probably a minute and a half out. And when I got there, uh, I put on, I already had, my patrol vest on underneath underneath the shirt kind of like this and i took the time to run to the back of the, the tahoe and get my entry gear and my rifle um and i remember seeing you know those officers those bike officers wearing the uh neon vest mm -hmm. and, and no no kind of protection just charging in and i kind of felt like you know, a bitch at that point because I wanted to get protection. These guys are not even considering it now. Mm -hmm. um, and they were charging just headlong, you know, to ch charging in the, in the face of the dragons, what I like to call it. And so even now I feel a little guilty for taking that 15, 20 seconds to, to get my heavy armor. And then it wouldn't fit because I had my, my vest yeah. on. So I off of it and I just, push down the street, kind of going against the grain, um, going against the, against the flow. I'm going to bring up the map while you're talking, just so people can see just how far you were. Yeah. Straight shot. So you said so, you got there, your brakes were smoking. Yeah. Yeah. Even in three miles, my Tahoe was stinking. It was pretty right. But you know, so the whole you, city, I've never seen anything like that. The whole city, it was like a somebody kicked a fire ant mound with the red and blues just scattering all over the damn place. It was something I will never forget seeing that site. And so, as you pull up, you throw your gear on, you're going inside. You say that you even to this day feel a little bit of guilt about that. And the reason we want to point that out is because over and over we hear. In the media, in the news, these guys are just robots. This is what they do. Um, they don't understand that real feelings are felt, real ideas are felt out there, and that this stuff lasts longer than just that incident. Uh, a lot of people see it on the news. They're done with it within a week. You're going to carry this with you for the rest of your life. Um, and we're talking about something as simple as you being safe, making sure that you go home to your family, feeling guilty that other people didn't have the gear that you had. And so yeah. how do you clear your mind going into this situation? Because you have to be focused going in here. This is going through your head. Your family's going through your head. Uh, you actually saw brain matter, all that kind of stuff as you're moving into this building. Um, and for the normal person that, like you said, the one that's going to, that's going to quarterback coach everyone and say, you know, this is what should have been done. This is what could have been done. They don't know what they're talking about. No, no. Um, and, and when you're going in to meet the dragon, other than you saying that, you know, you had that, that guilt, let's move forward and say, what are you thinking? What's the next thing on your mind? How do you get to the next point in this night? Um, 
Well, I had, due to the radio traffic and what I saw, and, you know, and as far as the, uh, the, you know, the blood and some of the violence that was left on the street, those officers' body language, um, the, the, just the culmination of everything that I personally witnessed instantly made, made you have the most utmost of respect for your opponent um, to the point where, uh, you know, there's fear. I mean, just to be honest, downright honest with you, just completely scared shitless. Um, and then you, it, it goes into like a, like a dream state, like a trance. And it is one foot in front of the other at that point. Um, and you realize today is your day and all that training really does start kicking in and your all your senses heighten and you can smell things and you can notice things. You can observe things. You know, I saw a, uh, a black multi-tool laying on the street i would have never even noticed that and i actually took the time to pick it up and put it in my pocket on, on the way up to the uh, college um and i don't know why i did that but uh it's kind of a cool thing because we actually end up using it but um <clears throat> and at that point it's one step in front of the other he had shot his way into the college and the whole the glass door was shot out and i just stepped in and follow the blood trail and into a stairwell and in the blood in the stairwell the blood trail went up the, the stairs but there was a nice grouping in the concrete floor of i would say somewhere between five and seven rounds that had made a bowl into the concrete and all the debris was scattered everywhere so i knew he was uh taking a vantage point of, up high for an ambush point and, and you know stairwells about the biggest death trap that there can be and yeah. pushing into that stairwell is not not really a feeling you, that you can describe you know because you're playing hide and go seek and the winner lives and the loser dies and it's a, it's a manhunt and that stairwell is a, a, a spooky place especially when you already see where he's ambushed somebody coming in after him so we made it through the stairwell and uh is me and one other officer and we pushed out onto the second floor and that's when I, I see someone and again opening that door to the second floor you push out and there's just too many threats mm -hmm. too many threats for you to cover and you know i just want to take a second to say that the dallas police on my the thing i remember most from getting out of my tahoe to the mate the to when i made it into that college was the Dallas police officers, man, I've never seen such badassery. Just, I mean, these dudes were bringing it. I mean, they fearless. Um, I can't, I write, I don't know how to describe it. Um, I, I will never be able to describe it. You and know, you're the, talking was, about was everyone. Both, you're but, you're <laughs> not just talking about SWAT members. You're talking about everybody. No. Yeah, I didn't see any SWAT members. I, I didn't see any SWAT members at that point. Um, I'm talking about just the Dallas police family. Um, God, it was, it, it's something that inspires you on a whole different type of level. Um, unfortunately, when they saw me in the, in the, in my gear there, you know, they kind of parted the sea and I was like, Oh, me, damn. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was here to follow you guys. You know, but I wasn't trying to be point on this deal. I was, I'm here for y'all. What do you, you know, I'm following you, but, uh, but no, it was, it was, you know, but there, there was, there were some officers doing opposite of that, but, but for the most part, um, God, it was, it was a sight to see. And it just makes me so proud of, of DPD and man, they were, you know, you you thumped that hornet's nest and it was on. They were they were wanting to handle that shit right right then, right there, and right now. And it was it was very impressive. So anyway, um, I can't let me ever tell that, that story. Let me, that Bain, so let, me, let me just say that must be a really like you talk. You know, Dustin alluded to you carry that on, but that's the intriguing part of this is such a tragic, avoidable, awful death of some great 
people in law enforcement, but then on the other side, the pride and the courage you saw, you know, usually don't go to hand like the hurt and the pain in, in, in the anguish, but having to be proud because DPD responded so well, that must be a really um, something you could grapple over all the time, but at least you came out of that being proud and, and you saw some things that were inspiring. So I just think that the psychological the dynamic with that must be extremely tiresome after a while, but at least you've hung on to uh, a lot of the positive that could come out of that, which is a good way, in my opinion, to to try to get something from, from that terrible situation. You know, and, and that's what the public doesn't understand. Um, when there are good men and women that are ready and willing to do violence, um, on the behalf of goodness, that's a, that's a powerful thing. It's, it's a rare thing and it's a very touchy thing. And it's a thing that, um, people don't understand, uh, the general public, they don't want to see it. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to know it. They don't want to understand. All they want to do is criticize it. Um, but that night, um, there were very strong, good, good men and women ready to do violence and intended on doing so. And, um, that, if that doesn't get you, you know, just a sense of pride, like I've never, I've never felt that and probably won't ever since, you know, since then. So anyway, we're, uh, I, we're making it up to the second floor and the first group of officers, Kennedy, Danny Kennedy, Ryan Scott, Brandon Barry had already done what I did probably two minutes ahead of me or more, two or three minutes ahead of me, which I don't understand because I hauled ass down there. I don't know where they were, but they must have been, they must have been super close. Because Listen, I know Danny too. And for all I know, he went through a portal to get there because that he is a fantastic yeah. officer. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And he brought his two buddies with him. So the, the three amigos, <laughs> it's pointed out in the book right. numerous times, the three amigos. And they tracked him down and they, they found him. They tracked him down. They found him and they went, um, and they went ham with him. You know, they <laughs> traded legs. They, uh, they, I mean, he, bad guy opened up on him and Danny engaged first. Um, then Ryan Scott, you know, clears the whole hallway with a, it doesn't just a whole magazine down the hallway. And this guy was good, you know, uh, all the feelings I had going into this before I made contact with him, he proved him to be true. Um, he, he was, he was as formidable of, a, of a, an opponent as you're ever going to have. And he stood toe to toe with those three SWAT officers and uh, had a, had a lengthy shootout with them. And that's when I linked up with Danny. He, he left um, Ryan Scott, Brandon Barry and, Lopez, who's now in SWAT, on that corner, standing point, standing guard, and Kennedy found me, and that's when I linked up with the team, and um, we just kind of dug in and and had a gunfight with him. So, well, let's uh, let's, let's talk about that as you, as you link up with him and you start to have the gunfight and uh, everything is starting to. You and I have talked about this, and we talked about. I, I kind of want to talk about the positions just so people understand, uh, because of course we're not going to show any you know pictures of the hallway and stuff like that. Uh, most people have been in a you know a high rise building; they know what the hallways look like. But if you can kind of describe the positions where he was, where you were. And, and the reason <laughs> there's really nothing separating you guys, but some drywall. And we need to talk about the ammunition that was used, the, uh, the kind of weapons that he was using just to show the level had been amped up. You said, as you're going in, man, this guy knows what he's doing. As you go up the stairs, the closer and closer you get to him, you realize this guy knows what he's doing. Right. And one thing I wanted to mention in the stairwell, that first ambush point where he came to, we tied the corner there and there's a nice pile of puddle of blood in the floor. 
and you can there's smears on the wall and then you could see where he had written in blood r r b was written in blood on the wall and that told me a lot about his mindset and i looked at the position that he was in and that's the position i would have taken if i was trying to ambush i mean everything i kept seeing about the guy scared the hell out of me as far as his his tactics, his confidence, and his mindset more than anything, his mindset. Um, and, and that mindset so, being, hey, I'm going to take out as many people, and if I die, that's just what's going to happen, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. He's, and so, anyway, uh, Dustin, what? where were we? I just had remembered that, and I wanted to mention it. But So, uh, <clears throat> as you get up, you link up with the team. You and I have talked about the position he was in, the position you were in. Pretty much there's just open air and drywall separating you. But the reason I want to talk about that is because we need to talk about the weapons that not only you were using, but that he was using the tactics that he was using. So let's, as you link up with the team, you move to the second floor, you guys have located him and we move on from there. So as I'm in route, I'm getting here in description. I'm hearing that he has a plate carrier on. And so when I went in the street, when I went back there to the Tahoe to uh, grab all my kit, I, conscience I, I made a I made a decision to grab bonded ammunition a magazine with bonded ammo in it which is um barrier rounds it's penetrator rounds and I almost fed those into the rifle um and I actually was struggling okay ballistic tip or bonded which am I going to feed here I fed the ballistic tip I loaded with ballistic tip and um those duty rounds we used to have um we've since changed to a semi-bonded round but they're great for fleshy targets, animals, you know, um, but for any sort of intermediate barrier, even a lightweight barrier, they're, um, they're actually not very effective. They're going to, they're going to fragment. They're going to yaw, change directions. They're just, um, great for if you have a soft tissue target. Um, but anything in between there, they're going to really uh, diminish the, you know, capabilities of the round. And, when we got into the college and I linked up with the uh, other SWAT guys, I made the decision. I think I'm going to be shooting through a door, through a wall, through a window, through some inner, through some some material here. And so I changed over to the bonded ammo. Um, And that was, and I, at that point I did not realize how close I was to him. And when I changed into bonded ammo, he says, he's, he, uh, he goes, woo, y'all brought the big guns out. And I said, and I realized, and I asked Kennedy, I'm like, who is that? And he goes, that's him. And that's when I realized that we're on top of this guy. And we're on a, on a corner. There's a hallway straight ahead and into a wall. And then another, there's a door there and then another hallway. So it's slightly offset. You know, they're not, let me get on the camera. They're not lined up like this. They're slightly offset. And so we only had a sliver of that hallway that we could see down. And so it wasn't like a straight hallway. He's on one corner and we're on one corner. And that's probably the only thing that saved our ass, to be honest with you, um, with the amount of rounds that he, he put down on us. So there's your, you know, your, the answer about what the hallway looked like and a little, a little bit brief, you know, discussion about the ammunition. And so, so let's talk about uh, Let's talk about the, you said the amount of rounds that came in on you. Um, We tried to get some audio. What I'm going to do is feed it through some other software. I'm going to put it up on the Facebook group so that people can hear just the chaos that was going on. But when you talk about rounds, there is so many rounds coming down range uh, at you and your position and just kind of anyone that he feels is a threat. Um, Can you speak to that a little bit? That was um, one of those things where when it started, you just really wished it would stop. You know, you just like, because you can't help but think, okay, when this hat, when I get hit, is it going to hurt? Is it going to burn? Is it just going to be, boom, lights out? Um, Man, what's this going to feel like? Because I'm one of these got my name on it. There's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts, you know, and the sheetrock's just busting all around us. Um, And, I'd never seen bravery. I mean, these dudes didn't flinch. The first volley, when I got there and I was getting straight and figuring out 
my head from my ass and trying to reload and all this stuff. He, that's when he opened up on us for the first time. I, I flinched like, uh, not just like that, but I, I jumped. It scared the hell out of me. And I was the only one in the group that went like that. And then I was like looking at him like, damn, or if they just saw me going to this mode because because nobody else, nobody else. But I'm like, you know what? That's not fair because they're acclimated to all this. This is my well so shit. Scared, dude, you, the hell out of honestly, me. you're being but, hard on yourself. But anyone getting shot at like that, I mean. I might have shit my pants. So more power to you. Oh yeah. And, and yeah. so let's talk about that. As you're getting that volley, you flinch. But but I think when you and I talked about this, you want to talk about the guy that was standing on that wall, and sheetrock is just shattering around him. Uh, and, and I want to point these guys out because I think that everyone needs to know who these guys are. They they had unbelievable unbelievable bravery that night. So as you're standing there. You're getting ready to advance. Uh, who is on the wall as drywall is just shattering around them? Brandon Barry. Brandon okay. Barry was standing point, and he ate it. He just he stood there and he ate it. And uh, as as frightening and as just terrified as everything was, I remember thinking, "How is this guy such a badass?" I mean, what? I mean, damn. You know, there's, it's not like we're behind the APC, you know, it's, it's, it's not like we're down the street watching some gun battle. It's, this is coming right at us and, and we know what kind of rifle it is. Um, and he stood there and he just took it, you know, he ate it and thoroughly impressed that guy, you know, he's my hero. <laughs> you can quote that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Love you, Brandon. But, um, but no, that, that was I don't care. I don't care what anybody says or anybody thinks. That was a very incredible thing that I saw, you know, from from a man to do that. And, you know, when you're in the stack, you rotate out. And I don't care if it's a hostage rescue, a BP, a barricaded person where you're just posted up. You relieve each other. And it doesn't matter if it's just some bullshit offense where you're just waiting on the guy to to get tired or if it's an active shooter you don't have the luxury of saying, um, Hey, I want to be, I want to be point right now. And you damn sure don't have the luxury of saying, Hey, I'm not going to run point. You run point. You rotate out. And after he absorbed 17 rounds, uh, I, I or so, um, and that was just, that was probably the fourth volley. Then I tapped up. I said, I got point. I'll take it. And he, and we rotated out and that was my turn. Um, that's when the decision was made to push across into a concrete stairwell. And we were actually having a little bit of a, uh, a debate because leaving that hallway, we were giving up our line of sight and pushing into that stairwell. He was going to be three feet from us before he saw, before we saw mm. him. Mm. And he, and we knew for a fact he was going to make a charge. I mean, there's, you know, the amount of balls this dude's had and everything he had done. We, we know he's coming at, he's coming for us for sure. And that was my heart heartburn with it was, um, he's going to be three feet in front of us. And that's when we're going to have our engagement and, and we're going to get, one of us are going to get killed. And then he pokes out and me and him had a, had our chance at each other. And that's when I just started eating that wall up with that bonded ammo just started walking those rounds into them um, as best I could. They made it to the stairwell um, and I'm stuck out there by myself at this point. And that's where that auditory exclusion happened. And I completely shut down and I'm looking down the hallway, just completely focused. And I'm not realizing that I'm doing it because uh, I don't know, fear, I guess. And I just knew that he was going to charge just headlong at me and we're just going to have a a toe to toe. That's kind of where I started thinking, man, is this going to be quick? Is it going to hurt? You know, you know, what, what's, what's it going to be like to die right here? And then I hear Kennedy, um, call, I think he called me a fucking retard is what he said. (laughs) And I look up because he had been over there making it. It's so weird. I hear Kennedy doing that. Well, he had been over there making some noise because he sees this, uh, 
this problem that I'm having, you know, and all these, this sheetrock getting in my eyes and my mouth. And he says, you're going to die. You got to move now. And I'm like, it's probably a good idea. So I got in the stairwell with them. We put a robot in the hallway so we could see the robot. We had a screen with us so we could see if he, uh, if he mounted a charge against us, we'd have plenty of heads up, see him coming. And remind me again, what, you talked about bullets, but what, what was X? He had multiple weapons, but what was he shooting at you guys mostly? What, what, he had an AK-74, he had, he had AK which is not an AK-47. Um, well, and, and, AK, and Matt, let yeah. me stop you right there, because that, came, that became a point of contention between him and the negotiator. Uh, or, or that was me where that was you and him, correct? Yeah. yeah. Well, see, I talked to him. I talked to him for half. Right. An hour, you negotiated for the first forty-five minutes, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, as you're talking to him, he says he has an AK-74, and you go, you, you, you were seeing if he knew what he was talking about, and he knew what he was talking about. So let let's talk about that that exchange between you and him. You're you're calling out to him before another negotiator gets there. You're talking to this guy for forty five minutes, who is intent on killing you and your entire team. Sure, and that's kind of a weird dynamic trying to kill somebody and then talk to him at the same time. Very, and he was funny. I mean, the guy was making me laugh. Um. And then we try to kill each other. It's crazy. But um, <laughs> but so I asked him, I asked him what he was shooting at us with. And he said, an AK. And so I said, oh, you got an AK-47? He says, no, no, an AK-74. He enunciated it. And I'm like, so he wanted me to respect his weapons platform, his choice of weapon for his job. And I did, you know. And then I said, that's when I said, well, who are you? Um because to yeah. be honest with you, some yeah. of the vernacular that he was using, some of the terminology and everything, I thought he could have been police. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I, I even asked him, hey, man, are you a cop? And that was apparently highly offensive to him. <laughs> um, he cussed me out for that. And so, yeah, it was, you know, it was weird. But he, he, he had been training for this, you know, and physically, mentally. Um, I've never seen or heard of anybody like him since. Hope I never do again. But he was very skilled, knew his weapon system. Um, you know, he didn't go. He didn't go grab some rusty old SKS and you know just go on a rampage. This guy was methodical, and he was pretty graceful in his tactics. And does it seem to be? You know, when we talk about this, when you say you talk to him and he was funny and he made you laugh and then, yeah, you know, you went to, hey, we're going to have to kill each other. I laughed at his jokes, but we're going to have to kill each other. But I want to again talk about the mind state behind this, okay? Because it's not that anyone, once again, we go back to those Monday morning quarterbacks. You have a guy actively trying to kill you and everyone that is a part of you. And he specifically was targeting white police officers. Yes. And he made that very clear. And he made that very clear. And you're talking to him. What goes through your brain? That's not a normal thing to talk to a person and try and get them to come out to you and talk when they're intent on killing you. Sure. You know, have you ever just looked into the eyes of a rattlesnake or some sort of reptile that just, I'm trying to think of something that has no soul and they're just (laughs) damn evil and Uh, deadly. A ginger? (laughs) That's wrong. Wrong. But but that's uh, that. You know, he had. You know, on your worst your worst day, and you're like, you know what? I'm going to kill myself. So you get so we go you get a bucket like this, and you fill it with water, and you stick your head in there because you're going to drown yourself. Nobody. I don't care how intent you are. You're not going to have the ability to actually ground yourself. Um, this well, because that bucket murder. had all kinds of holes in it, Matt. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, in there. Hold your breath. This, this guy's mindset was he could have drowned himself in three inches of water. I, I, it's hard to describe. It was almost like a, like a robot with a personality. Um, okay. Evil. I mean, just the scariest shit you could ever imagine um just a 
just a very evil, evil person. I'm and, not really describing really, her. You know, not not to get off the mindset subject, but just quick knowing this ex and his his skills and his preparation and his mindset and his psychology. It's a miracle that there weren't more, more lives lost, to be honest with you. Um, I think that's yeah, the testament yeah, to what you guys did. But um, that's the scary part of it is he probably went away from this going, man, I didn't get as many as I really wanted. And, and if it weren't for those three, there no doubt there would have been, unquestionable. And, I mean, he was nowhere near done. He was so damn pissed off and disappointed that he had gotten trapped. And it couldn't have worked out any better, actually, um, where he ended up being at the end of this hallway. It, it was just a dead end hallway. And the only way to get out of it was to come across us. And, you know, if it weren't for Ryan Scott and, and, and Kennedy and Brandon Barry, we'd have had a, a higher body count. No doubt. No doubt. And so <clears throat> as we're talking through this, so you're, you're, you're talking to him, you're going to bring him out. Um, we've talked about the things that are going through your head. You're going to die here. Is it going to hurt? How do you take those things and push them down and don't let them surface and move forward? Cause the guy next to you is standing there and he ain't going nowhere. Not even flinching. And that's how you do it. That's and the so, only way you do it. And so you push forward with this guy. You try and talk to him. What are you guys talking about? You say you laughed at him. What What are you talking about? Um, one of the things that kind of we both laughed at was between all of us shooting at him, behind him was a door with a big glass window in it. And there was a piece of it just kind of dangling. Well, eventually it, it, it broke loose and it fell and it shattered on the ground. And that apparently was right behind him. Kind of like this window here, actually. Um, so he's, he's in his little hide over here. And a piece of this window falls and you can hear him. You hear him dump the safety. You hear him posture up. You, you, you hear him tensing up. And so, of course, of course, I do the same thing. I flinch. I go off safety. And I come on the sights and I'm, and then he goes, he starts laughing. He goes, man, I thought y'all were coming to get me. And I laughed and I said, I thought you were coming to get me. And it was because a piece of glass fell and hit the floor and scared the shit out of both of us. And, you know, it was just kind of being able to, I guess, laugh. It helped. It, it, for, personally speaking, for me, it kind of helped get me through that four hour ordeal. Um, you know, even even when I came across the into the stairwell, there was an officer coming up the stairwell when I made it in there. And he told me months later, I see him. And he said, well, Baines, why were you laughing when you came into the stairwell? I said, what are you talking about? He goes, man, you were laughing when you made it in the stairwell. You were laughing. And I said, uh, that's something I do when it's just real bad, crazy crap happens. I think it's a I, I think I was just laughing because I couldn't believe I'd lived through that. And it was. I don't know. Don't know why I was laughing, but it's not the first time that somebody's asked me that in a in a bad situation. But um, you know that. Anyway, um, well, laughter yeah. and crying sometimes. Yeah, you know, one in the same. so hard you can cry. You know, you start crying, then you start laughing. Those yeah. emotions can cross over and be really quirky, and your body is responding. But I guess your body's telling you, "Hey, I can't cry. I gotta laugh." You know, <laughs> right. Like, yeah. It's kind of one in the same, I guess, in, in a situation like that. So who's on your mind? Let's talk about who personally is on your mind. Of course, this guy. But what else is going through your mind? Honestly, um, I didn't allow that, you know, okay. I, uh, because those are the people I got to come home to. And that's that's actually not going to do me any good in that situation it's going to do the opposite um when you're trying to live through a gunfight or something like that you are it's 100 percent focused on your objective um 
I didn't I didn't start having those thoughts until after it already been processed and I was on my way home. That was a sorry, sorry, horrible ride home and the sun was coming up and it was actually a beautiful day. I remember it. Something I'll always remember is the ride home and, you know, pulling into this driveway. Um, and, you know, that's when you start thinking that what those officers, what, what I'm going home to, there's five that, that won't, you know, and ever, ever again. And the magnitude of that is not, you know, comprehensible. And it's today, even, you know, all the, all the little, little things that we enjoy in life that those families are just done. And I never will never have it again, ever. And because of a coward, you know, and that's what, that's why it just calls me to see the way the public treats us now. They just don't know. They don't know about things like this. And that's why I'm talking to you now. Um, it's for them. And there's just, it's not fair. It's not right. And those families are forever. You know, this guy rearranged their family trees just because he wanted to, because he was a coward and shot him in the back. And and it was race that's related. Fair. That's the thing. It was, it was race related. Sure. Yeah. yeah, because they were wearing that uniform because they were white police officers wearing that uniform. And it's just uh, and, you know, that's that's what never that I don't ever stop thinking about that. I don't ever stop dealing with that. And never, you know, never will. You know, my son graduates from high school or, you know, one of my other one of my son's score a goal and then you, you you just can't help but think what those other families don't have just the small stuff mm. not to mention the big stuff so and and for us to hey dallas officers be quiet don't talk about this that's not fair to do to these these five men who who are the utmost of heroes who are out there showing the nation how to properly handle the Black Lives Matter protesters. We were where they were, they were handing out hugs and respect all the while being cussed at. We were showing the nation how to do it. We were representing and we did do that. And we did it and it was done. It was finished. And then they get murdered cowardly from behind. Um so it's it's hard to just be quiet about that when when people from neighboring cities don't even know what July 7th is. You know, that morning I pull into my driveway and I'm in my Tahoe because I can't bear to come inside this house. And the sun is up and it had just come up and I'm watching moms with little strollers walking down the street, somebody walking their dog. And I've just been through hell and these five officers will never go home. And I'm looking at these people and I'm saying, do they even care? Do they even know? And do they even care? And so I'm not going to be. You know, I'm not going to be quiet um, for their behalf, for the sake of them and their, their children, their families. You know, we owe it to them for their their heroism, their sacrifice to be known and to be heard. And so when we talk about that and you say that. Uh, you know, all of that goes through your head after this is over. In the thick of the battle, though, none of that is going through your head. Your objective is on what has to be done. And is there a point when you realize in this? Well, of course, you've already realized this isn't going to end well for anyone. We, we, we've we made that decision long right. ago. But is there at a, a point in your brain where you go, we're not going to talk this guy down. We're, this is not going to end with him coming out and saying, I give up or anything like that. Is there ever a time in your brain while this is going on that that crosses it? And, 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 and maybe you don't turn around and tell everyone that, but in your brain, you go this, there's only one way this ends tonight. 
Well, that um, <clears throat> I never even had to have that thought because that was understood. That was okay. understood. And, and the 40th round that passed me probably by the first one, I already knew that. Mm -hmm. And he did nothing but reiterate that to us verbally and physically uh, by shooting at us. I relaxed, so to speak, once the ballistic blanket showed up, the shields and support showed up. That's when I knew, okay, <clears throat> very unlikely for any of us to get killed at this point. And I relaxed, um, kind of dug in, let the negotiations begin, and was just real curious to see how we were going to, you know, be able to kill this guy. And, and what time? What time are we talking about? So this all kicks off when when you arrive. What time did you arrive? Do you remember? Um, it was that time of day where you don't know if it's more dark than it is light or more light than it is dark. I mean, okay. it's right at twilight. Um, so whatever time that is in July. It's in the summer is July, so it it was yeah eight thirty ish maybe. Yeah. And so what time are we talking about now? Blankets so, show up. Probably half half an hour to 40 minutes when I realized when, when SWAT started staging and getting things in, in play and getting some ballistic protection and bad guys just flowing with, with communication. He, he never, he was not a hard person to talk to from beginning to end. He was very engaging in conversation. Um, and so, someone checked have in real quick. Sorry, chapter 10, the ambush said at 8.58, the first gunshot echoed uh, across Lamar Street. So, okay. yeah. Uh, yeah. And so you probably got there 9.15-ish? By the time the, the tone goes out, by... No, man. If, if the first shot came out at 8.58, I was probably yeah. there at 9.02 at the most. You so arrived on scene be, at 9 yeah, It can still be light, lightish out. Yeah. So I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And and so and so everything gets there, everyone gets dug in, you get a little more comfortable with the situation, the negotiations start. And later on, we're gonna have Larry on. Of course, you're friends with Larry. Um, we're gonna have Larry on to talk in depth about the psychology behind the negotiations and stuff like that. What do you do as this is going on? Because now we're taking a different stance in the situation. Uh, we have negotiators in there. We have ballistic blankets. We have shields. We have all these different things. What mindset do you go into now? We're still holding point, um, and we're passing around the, the screen that has the robot feed on it. So we're still primary. Um, the negotiator is he's over there on the same corner that we were having our gunfight on, but now it's got ballistic blankets draped over it. So um, we're still primary with rifles. We're still hard cover. Um, but there was also an officer behind a, a shield with a rifle. So, so we, we were, you know, we were kind of impenetrable at that point. Um, and I knew that my trigger time was probably over at that point. Um, I knew he wasn't going to be able to get past us or get any of us. And it just turned into a straight up BP barricaded person at that point. And, um, but I, I, I had zero, never a split seconds thought that he was just going to get tired and give up that never, I've been on way too many of those and you'll get your feelings of what you think is going to happen. And, you know, I never, never thought this guy was going to consider a surrender. And, and so you're still on point. You're, you're acting as backup. How long does this, uh, and by backup, I, I use that term very loosely backup to the negotiator who's trying to do these things. Um, you move into this new, uh, fighting stance. Uh, you let those happen. Everything's going on. Is a plan being formulated as the negotiator is talking to this guy? Are we thinking, okay, what's our next step? This is going to, you know that this is going to fail, but as, as the command staff, as everyone's looking into it, if the possibility of this fails, is there another plan to put in place? We were at that point coming up with plan A, B, C, and D on terminating his life, period. Um, 
And in the meantime, if he happened to throw his gun down and come out, hey, that's okay too. But um, that's negotiator's job. Okay, that's what his that's negotiator's job is to get this guy to come to a peaceful surrender. Um, everybody else there is devising evil little plots on how to um, terminate a life. And there were some wild ideas that ha was hatched. Um, and this is always going to be a point of contingency um, on who did what, who, you know. And even after reading the book, I was I was like, that's not how I um remember that specific plan being hatched because it was Marshall Milligan's the first time I heard it personally. And bad guy was asking for a cell phone and Marshall said, well, if we're going to send the robot down there with a cell phone, let's blow him up. And I kind of laughed like that sounds like something out of like the road runner and Wiley e. coyote, you know, <laughs> blowing each other with those bombs and, uh, they called it into our sergeant and it was approved uh, quick and the breachers started rigging up uh, the robot with the explosive. They grabbed a library book to use it as a frame for the charge, took a boot knife and cut a circle, cut a circle in it, wrapped it with that cord. And in the middle of the donut hole, they smashed it with, uh, I want to say a half pound of C4, but I'm not, I'm not even sure on that. And they wrapped the whole package up in the hundred mile an hour tape, put it in the mandrels and sent it down there to them. And, and, uh, as, as we all know that have looked into the story, uh, bomb goes off, takes out the terrorist. Now I, I want to talk about this part because I think that of everything that was written about you, I think this can be taken the most out of context and, and you and I are friends and we've been friends for a while. And I know what truly goes on in your heart and your brain uh, from a friend level. I don't, you know what I'm saying? I don't know you as deep as your family or anything like that, but I think the next part was taken a little bit out of context or could be taken a little bit of out of context. I think you would agree with me and you and I have talked about this on numerous occasions. And so I want to talk about it. So after this is over, the teams move up. Uh, this has been what we're talking four or five hours into it now, right? Uh, yeah, about five hours. Uh, teams move up to, to secure the site, make sure everything is clear. And in the book, it writes that uh, you have an overwhelming desire to pee on this guy. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. But I, I think that, and, and I bring it up not as a joke. I bring it up because I think it can be misconstrued completely. And I don't think that's what's meant at all. And I want you to have the opportunity, you yourself, to explain this. Because I think it, I think it is going to be taken completely out of context. And I don't think it should be. Yeah. Yeah, it will be. There, there's, you know, a lot to say about it, actually. Um, when, when I... When I, and I'll admit, I probably did make that statement without a doubt. Um, and when I said it was well after the incident. And like I told you about Jamie, she can reach into your soul and pull things out of you. And she was interviewing me one day in a restaurant and I'm in uniform. And, you know, and Jamie had gone to the scene. She had seen my muzzle where the, 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 the scorch on the wall where my muzzle had burned into the wall where we were shooting and she had seen the destruction that the explosives had caused. She had seen the bullet holes. She had been there personally, physically been there. And so that does a whole lot to a person when you're getting deep and when you're telling this story, because you physically know exactly where someone was standing and you can really, take your mind there visually, you know, and she's asking me questions and she and I both were, were guilty of being completely just immersed in this, in this story, in this situation. And I'm in uniform and we're in a public place having, having a lunch and her question. And we were going play by play, play by play with this gunfight and, and everything because she had finally been to the scene and she was um, asking me very specific details. And 
the look on her face was very intense and I'm sure she was feeding off the look on my face. So we're basically both very submerged in the story. And, and she, she said, when you move down there to, to dead check him, you know, to, to view the suspect, make sure he's no longer a threat. So I was describing to her the position we were in and, um, you know, how I was shining my light on my M4 illuminating his body. And I was starting to become on the verge of getting emotional in this restaurant and I'm looking at her and she's kind of typing and I can see her hands trembling a little bit and I'm, and it's not, it's not helping me in my emotional state. And she said, well, what were you thinking at this point? And I said, well, I wanted to piss on him. And when I said that she busted out laughing, I busted out laughing and it was like, okay, mission accomplished. We're in public. We needed a break. We need to we needed to escape this uh, conversation because it was getting too dark and too deep and just too too evil. And you know, and 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 I said that as an as an escape route to a uh, you know to a situation I was in a year and a half after the incident. Now, that still doesn't mean that it's not necessarily true. If you have a loved one, your son, your daughter, your mother, whoever it is, that's very close to you and they are killed in a cowardly, cowardly fashion. And then that person comes after you with everything they're worth, with all their might. And you win and you beat them and you stand over them in victory. Then you'll know what I'm talking about. So it is going to be. Sense that. I, mean, I, I see where you're coming from, man. That That's a, yeah. you know, as humans and, it, you know, it kind of takes you back to the. You know, the, the days of combat where it was, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat, swords, you know, cannons, and um, victory over someone, you usually celebrated, you usually did something over that body. Like the Indians, you know, they scalped them. They did, did their deals. It was, a, you know, a thing. But honestly, after all that, like, shit, piss on them. I, I can understand how it can be taken out of context, but also have some deep meaning, if that makes sense at all. Sure. Yeah. I appreciate the opportunity to kind of clear it up, even though it's not going to do any good. I'm going to, I'll tell them what I'm going to catch for that one, but is what it is. Well, but I, th Matt, and I, I think, and the reason I brought it up, you and I have talked about it a lot. I, the reason I bring it up is because when you say I wanted to piss on him and I had an overwhelming desire to pee on him, it's two different things how it's right. said, how it's enunciated, it's two different things. And when you're talking like you just did about being the victor in someone that was intent on taking not only your life, but the five officers outside, the 12 that were shot, uh, everyone that was in your team, the, the hundreds of rounds that came down range, there's a difference when you say, I wanted to piss on him and... I had an overwhelming desire to pee. And I want you to get that opportunity to say that because I think people see that on the base level and I don't want them to think that's you because I know that's not you. I right. know that everything right. is calculated when it's said. And there was a reason that was said because the emotion involved, because of everything that you had gone through, because of everything that was in your brain. So I want you to have that ability to say, this is what I meant by that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and, and I got, I got a mother and a father and a family and, and, you know, that was a tough one to, to try to explain, um, to, to anybody that's close to me. They're like, what, what? Because it's just not something that anybody's going to understand. Now, do I wish it wasn't in the book? Um, yeah, I, I guess. Uh, but in a weird way, you know, as long as I'm provided the opportunity to maybe explain it, I'm okay with it being there. You know, I mean, I, I don't uh, think what you said was uh, disrespectful or should be taken out of context. Honestly, it's you know, um, the way I think of it is, you know, um, in our core, we're we're beasts. I mean, we're humans, but we're still animals, and we have evolved. But still, when there was a opponent X deliberately taken out white police officers and had already um, just thrown down some carnage in you guys 
um, um, basically said, hey, yeah, we got him. Um, there's a animalistic part of it. It's like, hey, I'm pissed. I'm going to mock my territory. Hey, we got you. But I don't want to assume that for you. But for me, I, I would think that was okay. I'm not going to put words in your mouth. Well, I, you, I, you know, the, the analogy you used about, like, scalping – scalping your opponent um i would say that's entirely accurate mm -hmm. now is that professional as a police officer hell no no like no 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 um but this was not a police officer shooting you know what i mean this was right this was complete with uh multiple multiple fatalities explosives um rifles uh this is not your typical police shooting. This and was a terrorist attack. That's that's exactly sure. right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's the way I explain it to like uh, if, if I get a chance to talk to the recruit recruits, which I do often, I you know, I tell them you can define a terrorist as is is any, you know, it, it depends if you're motivated by race, religion, um, you know, like even the guy that attacked headquarters, whatever motivates you into mass killing, hell, you're a terrorist in my book. Um, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter what your motivation it doesn't have to just be a, a religious group to, to be called a terrorist. In fact, when I was in route down there, I was pretty certain not to sound all wacky, but I was pretty certain we were under attack from a terrorist cell. I thought there were multiple shooters trained and that we were going to have our hands full in the streets and it turned out to be one guy who in my opinion was a terrorist so it's over we move past uh, uh, checking him everything turned I don't want to say it turns off but everything turns down for you is that okay to say yeah at, at, at finally it's it's time to turn things down a little bit you walk back first thing if you can remember it first thing that comes to your mind when everything's over he's been checked you're out of harm's way you're moving back to the vehicle that's when family you know um and i'm needing to tell my wife hey he, he didn't get me you know um he, he did not get me. I made it through. I will be coming home. And then I have a twin brother who was a police officer. He needs to know. It, but matter of fact, he was the hair on fire hauling ass down, down Dallas anyway. And he ended up finding me out in the in front of the college. Um, ended up being my companion officer, which was really, really cool thing. Yeah. Um, but damage control for my personal life was the first thing that, that came into play when I make it out on the street and I walked out into that fresh air and I realized that, um, it honestly was over, but then we had, you know, we had all the business to handle and had to go get processed and, and write my statement and get my mug shot and all that. Um, turn well, over let's my talk about that. Cause you and I have talked about that too. That gave you a strange feeling too. You know, I knew it was coming. It's not my first, not my second time to have it done. Um, and but I've, every time I've felt degraded, but this time was uh, was worse. And, you know, but that, that's police policy. That's Texas law. That's procedure um, involved in a homicide. What, but but here's the thing, Matt, I want to talk about when you say you feel degraded. There's a reason behind that. I understand Texas law, all these things. But you personally, why do you feel degraded? Because all the murder suspects that I brought up to Capers and they roll their fingerprints and they take a photograph of them. And they have them face forward, left, right. They treat you the exact same way and they're doing their jobs. It is uh, it's all documentation and it sucks. It absolutely sucks. And it, because of what you just went through and it really wasn't that it was because like I said, it wasn't, it was well, not like I was wearing a new hat. It was those five dead officers um, that made me feel a little offended, disturbed, um, you know, and, and degraded. Um, 
And it's not, it's not a being treated like, You were almost being treated in, like maybe but, a, the shooter would have been. Sure, sure. But, you know, so is every other officer before me and after me that's been in, 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 in those situations. Um, so I'm not, I'm not crying about it. I'm just being honest with you that it sucked. Um, and the police department and the investigators had their hands full on a whole nother level that night. I mean, I, I don't know how many months it took to process that crime scene. Um, so me being a little bitch worrying about my feelings getting hurt. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be that way about it. Um, but it does, it does kind of suck, uh, taking a straight up mug shot and having being stripped of your firearm, which is the only damn reason you made it out of there. And I think all of us in SWAT, um, kind of clung to our firearms pretty heavily for a year after that. We do anyway. Well, but, let's, uh, let's talk about that though. Um, that, that was a special incident too, when they're taking that away from you. Um, and specifically your rifle, if I'm not mistaken, and I don't want to overstep my bounds, but I think that's one of the, the most honest stories you've told about, uh, to me about this incident and it, it puts it on a whole different level, um, with your rifle and them asking for you to hand over your rifle, the thing that has just kept you alive these last um, if you don't mind, can we go into that a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, not to sound disrespectful, but the detective that processed me, I looked at him as a young ch kid, you know, um, he's like, sir, I need your weapon. So I unholster my pistol and, and kind of hand it to him. And he's like, um, did you shoot that? And I said, nope. <laughs> and he said, and that was just me trying my last ditch effort to be a dumbass, I guess, you know, and not give up my little security blanket. And he goes, I'm going to need your rifle. And I said, well, that ain't going to happen, dude. I'm just not ready to give this to you right now. And Kennedy was standing next to me like Baines. You know, you know the deal, man. Um, we're all good now. It's, you know, you're, you're going to have to give that rifle over to him. And I uh, mean, I knew I, it's not like I was going to throw a fit about it, but, um, you know, I just, uh, just it's my own personal issues you know i just didn't like the way the whole process goes and it's just uh in my opinion a little degrading disrespectful so i was being a little stubborn you know i gave him the rifle and got it back hell six eight months later a long time later after they had oh, done their man. really yeah yeah well, are you glad that you had danny there yeah i mean i wasn't gonna make a scene i was gonna give it up um but i just was bothered i was i was not gonna be cooperative to the point where they weren't gonna know that i was bothered by this whole process and again i respect it um and i've been through it before and i've never appreciated it never liked it but i'm thinking of these these dead cops you know and now i got my my own my own fam over here stripping me of my weapon it's just a weird deal you know it's procedures i get it you know and that's the thing people don't uh some people some of the public some of the the media the people who have they can't relate to that because either they don't want to or 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 they're choosing to not allow that to be a part of the equation and i think that's the downfall is you know police and especially someone like you and SWAT, what you do is heroic and you're specially trained and, and um, you're pretty much a badass. Um, and they don't understand that the, the bullshit you have to go through, right. not because of police, not because it's because it's state required. It's this required. There's so many rules and regulations already um, to, to even think there are going to be more, um, and how that's going to affect law enforcement in general. That's a scary, scary, um, circum, just a scenario to me, you know, sure. hearing what she just said. Um, um, but, and I can see how you would be hot. So it took you six to seven months to get your rifle back. Probably. Yeah. It took a while. If I remember how correctly, long did it take you to but shoot I mean, they had, they had, 
they had an ungodly amount of processing to do. I mean, the next day I had a, a had another rifle. Um, right. To mention. The, well, how long yeah. after you got that rifle did you go shoot it again? Um. Well, I brought it home in the neighborhood that day and shut. No, I'm just kidding. No, uh, I, I probably, I probably. Uh, Once again, let me make a disclaimer. Matt did not bring it home in the neighborhood. Like Matt. He's my kind of guy. But uh, I think I probably shot it that day or the next day. I don't, I don't really remember. But uh, I get your new dog back. Sure. Yeah, and that's what that's kind of what I compare it to. I mean, you ever gonna let somebody take your hunting dog out without you? Right. No. You know, you're not going to take my rifle either, you know. I mean, how loyal crazy. and faithful has that dog or sure. rifle been to you? And then there's that those nightmares you get like what what person is putting their is monkey fisting my rifle and messing something up to where when I get it back and I'm going to need to rely on it for my life and they've fouled something up in here. You just that's that is your survival tool and you don't want it around anybody else. Um for any reason and it's just the way it is you know especially when it's when you've used it to do battle and to save your life with you don't want i don't want a firearms expert or a, a certified armor or any anybody else around that rifle except for me it's just the way it is this way ask any of them they're the same way yeah well uh i want you to say what you really felt about that monkey what <laughs> You know, monkey fist, you know. No, your, no. I've known you, know you for too long to know that's not what you were going to say. Oh, man. Don't worry, so, Bane. So over. How many hours are we on right now? Oh, five, six. Okay. And that's since that's since uh, the first shot rang out. Um, you know, I we showed up. We had a rifle call that morning. At right. probably 9 a.m. Right. So it was a long day. So everything's over. You're processed. You've given up your rifle. You've you've done everything that you needed to do. Uh, it's time to head home. Now, there's a lot of stuff I want to talk about here. And the reason I want to talk about this kind of stuff is because I think this is one of the most important parts of the story, if not the most important part. Of course, uh, without question, the officers, the violence that he inflicted, those families that are changed forever are at the very top of that list. What I mean by this is one of the most important, if not the most important thing to talk about is survivor's remorse, uh, survivor's thoughts, PTSD, um, and everything that's involved that once again, that we talk about those Monday morning quarterbacks don't see, don't feel, don't understand. And we can say that do not understand and don't care to understand yeah. it. So let's start first off with thoughts as you're going home. We touched on it a little bit, but I want to go more in depth about it because I think that this is in the book. This is the best part of your story. Um, the drive home, the drive home. It was without a doubt the most saddest, I guess that's the only word I can think of feeling that I've ever had in my life. Um, I, you know, I guess I could identify with what true depression feels like um, because I actually go over this real beautiful lake on my way home and the sun is coming up and I'm going over Ray Hubbard and it is just so beautiful. And that just was crushing to me to know that these lives are forever altered. And, you know, these, these guys that could have been any one of us were just terminated right there on the street because why, you know, and still, still why it's been, you know, all this, all this violence against police. It's like you, idiots you know why you just don't it's just the most ignorant uh, anyway um sadness is what i felt well i don't want you to say anyway matt i want you to go into this i i think this is the most like i said one of the most important parts of this story i don't want you to say anyway as you feel this i want you to talk about what you mean because i think that's what people need to hear in these times well it's hard to go down that road without getting political 
you know um i started my law enforcement career in the 90s and never in my life ever in my life did i feel like i had a target on my back i mean to an to an extent when you're uh, to an extent you do um when you're chasing a bad guy or you're in a situation but just in general um and then when the obama administration took over he snuck up and he put bullseye on the backs of uniforms and he did that by giving merit to felons who died committing violent acts against law enforcement and giving them credence and giving and campaigning with their families. Um, that turned the American, a portion of the American citizens against the police, to, against the police officers in this nation. And that's the reason I had a gunfight in a college in downtown Dallas. And so the overwhelming sense of sadness and anger and defeat is what you know i'm struggling with on the way home how could that happen and, and and how in dallas how in dallas dallas police are known for being awesome i mean that's that's what we're known for and and if you're going to say opposite well you're a dumbass anyway and you hated us for your own because you got a speeding ticket and, and that's your own little personal right. problem dallas right. police are known for being awesome and and for all the stuff that was going on in Ferguson, Missouri, and all that to, to come to a head here, and we have to we have to pay the price when we're down here handling our business. Um, it's I'm infuriated still to this day over that, and it's it's just gotten worse. And I think right before the Dallas, you know, the the Dallas shooting um, was it. Louisiana just had a few shootings right before that. No, they Louisiana that, happened after us. They tried after to, they okay. Tried to yeah, they tried to mimic the Dallas shooter. Right. Okay. So I got it backwards. But and then you're seeing this. So so to me, um, and I'm going to speak on a civilian behalf. And and um, number one, I can't imagine what your wife and your family must have felt. Um knowing I'm a husband of a police officer and um, I can't imagine what that must have felt for you, for them, um, for your lovely wife, that, that must've been pure brutal hell. And um, I think that that's the, a, a microcosm of what's going on in society, whether you're, it's not about, you know, you should always support police. You should always support, um, the good guys, in my opinion, but I think it's been being so twisted and turned. We still have the Black Lives Matter thing going on, and we're still having the same issues, and we're still having the same rioting in in hatred. In um, you know, two officers were shot in Louisville after the the grand jury's decision. Um, to me, so much of mainstream media and social media and all this that everything's been twisted so bad that um, they didn't need much of a push anyway, but they got the push they needed. And I'm kind of just airing and venting here. Um, um, I've had some of my run-ins with, with my beliefs and feelings. I try to be careful um, for the show, um, for public perception and all that, but there's just certain things I see and, um, I just don't agree with and, and I'm not afraid to be outspoken about them. I, I, I'm just really not. Now I'm not going to get into a race debate with someone. Um, I don't believe that's where I want to go, but protecting police, defending police, what they do, why they do it, how they do it. That's to me, the biggest insult that that is facing our, our society right now. And, and I don't know how and when we're going to overcome it, People like you telling your story, um, knowing the dynamics of all these situations, but still then I don't know if things are going to get better. Knowledge is supposed to be this, this um, freeing thing, but if someone doesn't want knowledge and is not trying to gain it on situations they don't understand, then 
you know, what's the freaking point? Well, and, and the more we keep the, these police departments and these chiefs, these command staffs keep um, bending to the media and the, right. and the pressures from, from people standing behind keyboards demanding these policies that, I mean, I don't, I don't go to NASA and tell them how to build their rocket ships. So why, why, why are we listening to these people who have, they don't even know what Texas law is or any other state law for that matter, demanding all these policies and procedures. And then, then these commanders bow to that and it makes it incredibly unsafe for police officers. And, you know, it started back when all of a sudden, no chase policy. Then there were there was a, a a foot chase policy that came out. That's when I realized, and this is ten years ago, we got problems. <laughs> and man, you know, and that's what we are. That's what we are. We we are we are hands off, uh, extra nice, extra kind. And now we wonder, hey, why is our crime rates out of, out of control? But if you ask me, it's the taxpayers are getting what they are voting for. They're getting what they want. They're getting what they're asked for, and they don't understand what they're asking for. It's like having a, a trash truck comes to your house, okay? Trash man comes to your house on every Thursday, but he comes at 7 a.m., and his trash trunk is, is – his, his truck is really loud, and it stinks. So you call, you call the utilities department and say, hey, um, I'm a taxpayer – Every morning, Thursday morning at 7 a.m., your stinky loud truck wakes me up. So they say, okay, and they take you off the trash route. In about three weeks, you're calling back, hey, I got all this trash. And they're like, yeah, uh, take it out yourself. When you call 911 because you want us to come take out the trash, then shut up and let us do our jobs and let us take the trash out how it has to be done and quit being a crybaby about it. That's it's, it's that simple. If you're a taxpayer – you're paying for these services, but you don't want us to do the job safely the way we are trained, the way we do train. And the reason we train is for very specific reasons. And I'm tired of, you know, even almost having the uh, patience to try to explain this to people. Yeah. Defending um, yourself constantly is. Defending, yeah. yeah yes. it, it, that, I mean, who the hell wants to do that? And no matter what you're doing. Um, but can, can I just let me get to this and, and let me see if I can make. Be eloquent about it. Um, through through your personal experiences in, in your career, we've talked about undercover buys and all this. We never really talked about race in in, in in the roles because you know you're criminally profiling. I think there is a extreme um, misnomer about police in um, targeting uh, black individuals black men, you know, in, in how police think and they're trained. Um, can you speak any personal experiences or maybe something the police do? Well, when I hear it yes. relate to that. Sure. When I hear someone say these cops decided they're going to kill a black man today or a Hispanic man or a white man, that I know is somebody that I, that, that you can't talk to. Right. That is someone so full of ignorance that that there's OK, um, for the lack of a better way to describe it, I can't talk to that person. I'm not going to be able to have that conversation. Um, so just I'm, I'll just have to dismiss that because um, it's almost funny, you know, to th that people think that to the point where they really don't think that that no one no one on this earth is that stupid. They're just going to say that to trigger a response and get a conversation going. But, um, you know, it's not funny and uh, it's not fair. Um, <laughs> no officer wakes up saying I'm going to kill somebody today. <laughs> That's just. And, and for you to for you or anybody else to say that it's like, OK, quit, quit being a child. We're grown up here. You know what? How do you really feel? Now, that being said, I do understand that. Um, the reason we're in this situation is because there's legitimate concerns, there's legitimate needs and there's legitimate issues. I'm not saying we need to all go back to carrying six shooter revolvers and have wild, wild west. Um, I'm not saying we need to revert back to our old ways of policing. Um, you know, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but 
if you are a if you're assigned a beat a geographically you know a, an area a geographical area you were responsible for and that community is 90 percent hispanic well the two years you're on that beat you're going to arrest a lot of hispanic people and all the media is going to do is show you how look in two years he's arrested 20 white people and 200 hispanic people this is a blatantly racist police officer and they're not gonna they're not gonna flip over to page two or do any further digging than that other than to push their agenda and all the airheaded non-educated idiots that are gonna read that are gonna bite right into that and you're labeled you know that you're profiling against hispanics i mean it's this is basic this is 101 this conversation has, has been going on for for years you know we're not diving into anything new here um so it's just the public refuses to be educated and they won't listen, but they love to jump on the bandwagon. So in all this that we talk about, uh, the media, the people that don't want to learn, I, I believe that there is a silent majority out there. I, I believe that there are people that want law and order. I believe that it's a lot of people that want law and order. But in all that and going into this job every day and coming home, especially with this incident, how does this affect your family? You're married, you have kids. Uh, how does this affect your family? I think we do for the most part what other parents would do and we kind of shield the kids from it. Um, but I'm not gonna lie, it's uh, any, every, every law enforcement family can back me up from what I'm saying on this. And I don't care if you're Hispanic, black, white, Asian police officer, all of our families are suffering right now. Um, marriages are are suffering on a, on an all time high. Divorce rate is it's always been out of control for police officers, but it is off the charts right now. Um, this has stressed the law enforcement community, profession, and families out um, worse than worse than anything probably in our nation's history. Well, definitely in our nation's history. Um, it is the American citizens versus the police department. Um, and as far as the silent majority, well, that's a problem. And that is the problem. Um, you can't be silent. Um, not, not under, not when the whole country is right on the verge of just complete chaos. Every major city, at least every democratically controlled city is completely out of control. And you as a taxpayer, are okay with that i i mean that's because that's what we're as police officers that's what we see we're like are we not supposed to defend this person's business do they want us to or do they not want us to and and as an officer you really don't know well i don't so think I, you can even make that decision because there's sure. one answer to that right. Whether, right whether they like you or not you're there to defend it you prove that on july 7th right it's during a rally that is speaking out against your job and against your profession. When we say that's an open-ended question, I think we're fooling ourselves. There's no, there's no second answer to it. Right. We signed an oath. We took an that's oath. That's exactly right. Knowingly. And, and that's my point is there is no second decision for a police officer. There's no, well, they don't like me. I'm going to go down here and, and guard the people that do like me. It, it, that's not what you sign up for. That's right. not the oath you take. The oath you take is I'm here to defend whoever I need to defend. And so when we talk about how it affects families and things like that, I think that it's far reaching into we're four years removed from that situation, Matt. And without a doubt in my mind, I would say it affects you on a daily basis. Yes. And, and, and police officers, we're the worst. We eat our own. Um, even even this podcast is going to draw um, probably quite a bit of negative attention from the police department. Um, and God, we are we are the worst at uh, turning against each other. It kind of goes back to what I said the first when we first started. Quit being an asshole. Um, the the only motivations I have for for this July seventh involvement is to honor those heroes that people are telling us to be quiet about 
that's not fair to them. It's, it's not right. Um, and you know, I pray for their widows like nightly, daily, multiple times a day. And, you know, I just, they need to be recognized. They need to be known from now on forever. This was the, the most historic attack and assault on Dallas police officer or police officers across the nation. It's not something to be quiet about. And I'm not talking about using it as a training deal or we can learn from this. I'm talking about the personal lives of those families and those police officers need to be always remembered and respected, period. People don't know that we had 12 officers shot. And that could have been 17 down. And, and, and if it wasn't for you guys and your your tactics, it could have been double that. So, yeah, that's it's mind-boggling. And uh, you know what? I'll just say this. As, as a um, – a spouse of a police officer and um, I consider myself um, pretty diverse um, in a lot of my beliefs, my, my way of thinking, my friendships, um, my life experiences over the years. I played f football, um, even young growing up to where I'm at now. Um, it is very hard and discouraging, and, and it almost shuts me down when I see um, the hatred on social media, the intentional um, misconstruing of uh, situations, um, the attacks on police officers, the attacks on our democracy, the, the attacks on on so many things, and um, the last six, eight months, you know, and, and we talked about this pains and, you know, your wife may share some of the same thing as it's been hard. I've, I've angry and, 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 and I have uncharacteristically spoken out. Um, and, and sometimes even looked for those people that don't share my views on police and what's going on in the world and how, how much I disagree with, 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 the Black Lives Matter movement. There's nothing wrong with saying Black Lives Matter. The movement, if you fundamentally look at that, um, in, in their drop dead demand, um, and to think that's all okay, it's got me in a bad place. And, and, it, and it, I've had to come out of a hole that I was in. And God, God bless my wife. She's the one living it and doing it. I'm just the one on the other side. And um, I've had a lot of time on my hands. I, I, I've not traveled. I'm an area sales manager. So just from a spouse perspective, um, it is hard to see someone you love and many friends and loved ones you care about being so disrespected over false, uh, over generational issues that have nothing to do with what we have today. And it right. has pissed me off. And, you know, um, it's almost like who's pissing off more? Um, some of the people in the community are you defending, you know, law and order. And it's a lose-lose situation. And I don't know where right. we're going really, yeah. to fucking turn this thing around and, and, and steer it in the right direction. I really don't. I, I'm, I'm really concerned about um, the future and my kids' future. And uh, sure. God, there's got to be something that gives. Well, you think of all the law enforcement spouses that have been discriminated against it, or even family members that have been discriminated against at work because your brother's a cop or your husband, you're married to a cop. And, you know, used to, the last thing you'd ever want to do is screw with a cop. Nowadays, that's oh, because yeah. of the weak administration and the policies that we have. That's the best thing to do is go out and screw with a cop because you can't do anything. Mm -hmm. You you can't do anything uh, except take that harassment and that discrimination because your own department is going to discipline you on top of what you're what you're going through on that personal level. Um, and it's just a new age of bullshit that that we're dealing with as a as a profession. Um, 
And so I don't know if I would rather be the cop or the spouse of a cop right now. I mean, I honestly don't know. Um, yeah, it's tough. I mean, I, I feel horrible for my wife and, you know, I have three brothers and, you know, I know they, I know they catch hell because social media, everybody knows, you know, who's, who's mm -hmm. got a cop in the family nowadays. And I would have never thought that me being a cop is going to negatively affect my brother or my wife at work. It's uh, yeah. It's unbelievable. Unacceptable. Well, Matt, I want to kind of wrap this up. And yeah. first off, I want to tell you uh, with, with no uncertain terms, you are absolutely the definition of a hero along with all those guys that were with you, you're absolutely the definition of a hero. You stand that line, you never back away from it. And no matter what happens, you'll always be there and you can be counted on. I know you personally, and I know that to be true. Uh, I know that you have defended these five officers, everything that happened that night and kept their names at the forefront. So let's start with the Brotherhood of the Fallen. I'm going to put that in the comments of this live video. I'm going to put it out there. If you guys didn't hear before, it is an organization that takes care of spouses. It takes care of the children. Uh, when officers are killed in the line of duty, it also takes care of officers traveling to other places to attend the funerals of those officers. So it's a great website. It's a great organization. Uh, a friend of ours runs that in the Dallas area. If you just click on that, you can look in there and you can, uh, see everything that they do, everything that's available from them. Uh, and you can donate money. You don't have to donate money, but please just go check out the site and look at it. But there's also a place if you want to, to give there. The second thing that we want to talk about is the book that we talked about tonight. I want to make sure that everyone gets out to see this book. Jamie Thompson did an amazing job. She spent almost four years of her life writing this book. She hung out with Matt. She hung out with multiple people that were there that night. And she wrote an absolutely, absolutely fantastic book. So we want to make sure that people get out there. So what I'm going to do is put the links to the audio book and the hardcover book in the comments. So all you have to do is click on that. It'll take you right to the Amazon site. You can buy it. Uh, if I know you and you're in the area, I will see Matt sooner or later and I'll have him sign it for you, however you want done. So let's go ahead and put that in the stream and um, let's just take the time to just go check it out. Look at it on Amazon, do whatever it is you're going to do. There's the hardback cover. Uh, here is coming up with the audiobook cover. Uh, and that has changed over. That will be a link on there. So as soon as that pops up, uh, we'll try and finish everything off. So there you have it, guys. Brotherhood of the Fallen. Uh, you can go to that site. You can go to the hardback on standoff uh, for Amazon. You can go to the audio book. It's, it's uh, audio narrated very, very well. Uh, I've listened to a little bit of it. Matt was able to show it to me. For the dads that drink, Go to Facebook group, Dads That Drink. Click on it there. Instagram, double.speak.studios. And on Twitter, at DoublespeakDJ. Later on in this week, we're still setting the time up. We are going to have Jamie on, who wrote the book. And we're also going to have the negotiator of this. Larry Gordon is going to come on the show. Uh, next Friday, we have set up for Class Action Park. It's a documentary that came out that is an absolutely bananas theme park that killed like six people and they kept it running. So make sure you like, subscribe, everything you need to do. That guy down there, that's Matt Baines, a true, true hero. That guy over there is Jeff. Eh, he's an all right guy. He hangs out on the show with us. I'm DJ. This is the Dads at Drink. We will catch you on the next one. We'll see you guys later. Bye.